Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for joining us for the Hasekura Summit, the project related to the 115th anniversary of Tohoku University's founding and the 100th anniversary as a comprehensive university. My name is Yukiko Fujimura, and it is my great honor to be the MC for this event. And before opening, I'd like to explain the today's program and simultaneous interpretation devices. Today's program begins with a keynote speech titled Cultural Exchange Between the East and the West in 21st Century. From 1.30, Part 2, Future Directions of Research and Education of Social Sciences and Humanities will explain the significance of the social sciences and humanities in 21st century, the current state of research at the member state universities, and introduce the Hasekura League as well as global development of Tohoku University. From around 425 will be part three, significance of studying abroad experiences. The launch ceremony for the Hasekura statement will follow and the event is scheduled to close at six o'clock. Today we have simultaneous interpretation system. Channel one is for Japanese and channel two for English. First, press and hold the power button for about two seconds to turn on the power. To select the channel of the language, please press the up and down button next to the power button. To adjust the volume, press the up and down button on the right side. And place the earphones over your ears with the cord facing backwards. And when you leave the venue, we would appreciate it if you could return the receiver to the receptionist. Thank you for your cooperation. First of all, Professor Hideo Ono, President of Tohoku University, will announce the opening of the Hasekura Summit. Well, community members and honored guests, uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, as president of Tohoku University, I would like to extend a very warm welcome to you all. I am most pleased that so many people have gathered uh, here to celebrate uh, the 115th anniversary of the founding of Tohoku University and uh, the 100th anniversary of our becoming a comprehensive university. Well, the Hasekura Summit aims to give us a valuable opportunity to share opinions about the role of social sciences and humanities in today's world. We are delighted to be joined by the heads of social sciences and humanities departments at universities around the world well, most of which are members of the Hasekura League, an international academic exchange network led by Tohoku University. We have also had the privilege of receiving a video message from the Italian ambassador to Japan. Well, in today's world, uh, there are many issues, challenges, problems, such as climate change, where regional conflicts and clashes of values well, the humanities and related disciplines have accumulated academic knowledge about the way of thinking that is unique to each culture, the standards that have become the foundation of society, and the distribution and handing down of goods and culture. While looking at the world's issues and challenges, we can see that the role that humanities should play will become even bigger in the future. As the pace of change in the world increases more and more and un unforeseen situations become the norm, research across many fields carried out by a broad spectrum of people using a variety of perspectives and methods will help to build a sustainable human society. 
Well, in order to avoid and resolve disputes and friction, we all need to deepen our awareness of diverse cultures and value, values, to tolerate conflicting opinions and viewpoints, and to continue dialogue with one another. A broader understanding of human culture will also be a very important factor for innovation in scientific fields. The Hasekura League, uh, led by our university, is a strong and vibrant network that plays a major role in creating academic knowledge that can contribute to solving various issues in the modern world. The League was formed in 2015 to promote uh, open exchanges by researchers, and today 26 universities, including our universities, university, are participating members. The League Center, current center, is uh, in Europe, uh, but we foresee a future in which it develops into a truly global academic network with expansions into regions such as Asia, North and South America, Africa, and Oceania. Well, furthermore, with the Hasekura League as a background, the International Graduate Program in Japanese Studies, GPJS, was established at Tokyo University in 2018. It is based on the philosophy of Japan as object, Japan as method, and dynamic research and education continue to be practiced ac across the globe. In a world where the global and the local are often in conflict, this program seeks to actively tackle uh, contemporary issues and is a kind of program that today's uh, world needs. It does so by bringing into the con conversation the values uh, that have been cultivated in Japan, the manner in which we look at others, the research methods that have been developed, and the various disciplines that originate, originated in modern uh, Western world. I hope that the intellectual exchanges at this Hasekura summit will be an opportunity for everyone here, well, especially the young university and high school students, uh, to spread their wings and explore the world. I anticipate that we will all enjoy a meaningful exchange of each other's visions today. So with great pleasure, I hereby declare the Hasekura Summit open. Thank you very much. Next, Professor Toshiya Ueki, Executive Vice President of Tohoku University and Chairperson of Hasekura Summit Executive Committee will explain the program of the summit. Uh, thank you very much indeed uh, for joining us today. Uh, many leading experts and researchers from both uh, Japan and abroad who agreed to this uh, Hasekura Summit uh, have kindly uh, joined us today. A total of 39 faculty members and students from 22 universities from around the world participated in the Hasekura Symposium, which was held pre prior to this Hasekura Summit and they are also participating today. So again, I would like to thank everyone for their participation. I would like to uh, introduce on the opening slide of this presentation, the professors who have kindly traveled a great distance from their home country to uh, us, Japan, Sendai. Uh, there are four slides, uh, the uh, pictures and the names and the uh, there are each uh, organizations uh, in this slide. Uh, all over the world, uh, we are very honored to join, uh, welcome these delegations today. 
Uh, today's summit consists of three parts I would like to briefly explain. In part one, we will show you a video message from the Italian ambassador, uh, His Excellency Gian Luis Benedetti, on the theme of the significance of cultural exchange in modern society. It is indeed our great honor for Tohoku University to receive this message from the ambassador of the Italian Republic, which has deep connections with the Hasekura League at today's Hasekura Summit. Actually, as you know, uh, Hasekura Tsunenaga uh, traveled from the Sendai uh, Miyagi to Rome in Italy over the Pacific Ocean via Mexico and the Atlantic Ocean. So it was a great journey uh, from here, Miyagi, to Italy. So today we are very honored to uh, receive this message from the Italian ambassador. Uh, after the short break in part two, uh, we will welcome academic leaders representing each universities and institutions. Uh, firstly, uh, Professor Roberto Tottori, Rector of Oriental University of Naples in Italy. And Professor Sharain Olborg, Department Head of ASEAN Studies at the University of British Columbia in Canada. And Professor Harold Fuss, Director of the Heidelberg Graduate School of Humanities and Social Sciences at Heidelberg University in Germany. And Professor Machildo Mastorangelo, Vice Dean of the Faculty of Art and Humanities at the Sapienza University of Rome in Italy. And uh, Professor, uh, Professor Albert de Young, uh, Academic Director of the Leiden Institute of Area Studies at Leiden University in Netherlands. And Professor Franček Czech, Director of the Institute of Intercultural Studies at Yagi Yagironian University in Poland. And Professor uh, Simon Sarris, Vice Dean for Internationalization and Mobility at the University of Granada's Faculty of Arts and Humanities in Spain. All of these professors I have mentioned here are playing leading roles at humanities department at each universities involved at the Hasekura League. Uh, at today's summit, we will discuss on the significance and importance of research in the social science and humanities for our 21st century world and on the research currently being conducted at each university. The Hasekura League member universities are diverse, both in terms of the countries and the region in which they are based and the roles they are expected to play. I think that hearing from the professor's opinion and the information they provide, which are backed up by wealth of experience, will be a great benefit to all of us. After the short break, the third part will be for the discussion among young people who will play a leading role in research and education in future. Firstly, students on the International Graduate Program in Japanese Studies of Tohoku University will talk on their experiences studying abroad at Hasekura League Universities. And then there will be a Q&A session about today's summit as a whole and the deans of Tohoku University's Humanities and Social Sciences faculties will join on stage. We expect that everyone on the floor, especially young students and high school students, will give us their opinions. Finally, to wrap up today's Hasekura Summit, the professors who took the podium in the second session along with President Ono and the deans of Tohoku University's faculties and graduate schools of humanities and social sciences will jointly announce the Hasekura uh, Declaration. Uh, Hasekura statement. The Hasekura statement is a message to the world about our ideas which are now taking shape 
in various forms, and it will serve as guidance for our research and education in future. Now that the post-COVID world has come in our new reality, I believe we are about to embark on new intellectual journey. I hope today's Haseko Summit will be the starting point for a new intellectual adventure for everyone gathered here. Thank you very much for joining us. We'd now like to begin the first part of the program with a keynote speech. The title of the speech is The Cultural Exchange Between the East and the West in 21st Century. And we have a video message from His Excellency, Mr. Gianluigi Benedetti, Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentially of the Italian Republic to Japan. The Sense of Cultural Exchange in the Contemporary World. Please pay attention to the screen. President Hideo Ono, honorable members of the faculties, dear students, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great honor for me to participate in the celebration for the 115th anniversary of the foundation of this prestigious university. Unfortunately, concomitant commitments did not allow me to be with you in person, but I am more than happy to deliver this message to you through this video. As part of the community of the Friends of the Tohoku University, I attach great importance to the year 2022, 115 years after the foundation of this university and a full century since it became a comprehensive institution, including both liberal arts and sciences. However, for us all and for the rest of the world, the year 2022 will also dramatically stay in our memories as the year in which hard power abruptly returned to govern international relations. The war of aggression waged by the Russian Federation against Ukraine shocked the world, set an awful precedent, and showed the international community how fragile is the order we live in. This unprovoked an unjustifiable act undermines the foundation of the UN system and constitutes a blatant violation of international law. In addition to the high price that the Ukrainian population is paying in terms of human and material losses, this war is producing a terrible effect on the world economy, food and product supply chains, and on global shipping and travel. So here comes the question leading my speech today. What is the sense of cultural exchanges in the contemporary world? And as a consequence, what hope and expectation can a young woman or man have in this world? How can universities help them? Watching at today's uncertainties, one of you may object, what is the purpose of culture when we cannot renounce war? Well, I believe that art and culture can inspire people to progress forward, even in difficult times. In order to better understand the value of culture in international relations, we need to go back to 1990, when Joseph Nye theorized the soft power concept. Back then, the world was witnessing a major change. The collapse of the Soviet Union paved the way for a unipolar system. In a few years, the diplomatic community, as well as decision makers and scholars, got used to the idea that it was more convenient for states to influence specifically the course of event rather than changing it with war and violence. Therefore, culture came to play a prominent role in the perception of the state as a diplomatic tool. And today, just because tension are raising and core values are threatened again, it is not a good reason to step back. In addition, today, the spreading of cultural contents through the internet and mass tourism 
have increased the magnitude of the soft power projection. Media powerhouses such as Hollywood and the BBC or targeted campaigns such as Cool Japan, E Estonia or Essential Costa Rica prove that influence and reputation are successful promotional tools and that they eventually pay off. Even Italy, a recognized world cultural superpower, understood the full potential of such initiatives and launched a year ago its own nation branding campaign named Be It, which I invite you all to visit at madeinitaly.gov.it. The ones I just mentioned are just a few examples of how much culture matters in the contemporary world. And in this perspective, the role of the universities is critical since their main aim is to shape the next generation of well-informed global citizens capable of jointly ensuring peace, progress, freedom, tolerance, and democracy. The life you live in a community like the one you have in Tohoku truly resembles the one that in Latin is called universitas, which refers to learning with others. As you have already figured out, universitas, like the first one founded in 1088 in Bologna, constituted the basis for the modern university system. Through their study and research activities, universities were pivotal in spreading knowledge, and in the case of Europe, in leading its nation out of the Dark Ages, straight into the Renaissance. In the very same way as universities attracted people from far off places in the Middle Age and changed the way of thinking, so they need to act now, as communication and traveling are accessible to larger parts of the population. In the European Union, we celebrate this year the 35th anniversary of the launch of the Erasmus program, the most famous student exchange scheme that is currently available in 33 European states and has partnerships with 104 more countries, including Japan. From promoting student mobility, Erasmus evolved to support training, research, and teaching abroad, with more than half a million people participating every year. Throughout these 35 years, he had a quiet but steadfast impact on the lives of millions of Europeans, creating a common sense of unity and establishing bonds between people and cultures. Knowing well the opportunities provided by Tohoku University, I'm sure that a great number of you will take the chance to participate in the many international exchange program available or to take courses in a foreign language. However, the more these programs will be streamlined among big and small central and peripheral universities, the more the impact will be felt by the society as a whole with positive repercussions on other economic sectors. Under this aspect, Japan and Italy are similar as they share an advanced university system that could be more and more open to the outside. With the resources of the National Resilience and Recovery Plan conceived to reverse the negative economic impact of COVID-19, Italy is allocating more than 19 billion euros in structural investment in education and human capital. An additional 11 billion package is dedicated to linking the universities and businesses words, supporting research and development investments, promoting innovation, and realizing a better match between the skills currently offered by the universities and those required by the job market. In this context, in Italy, another long-term structural change took place seven years ago, when Milan hosted Expo 2015. 
In addition to the immediate return in terms of visibility and reputation, Expo Milan was an occasion to attract talents, start partnerships, and change the mindset of the Italian education and business communities. Thanks to a well-functioning public-private project, the area where once the National Pavilion stood is becoming an innovation district that already hosts a life science research institute and that soon will be complemented by the scientific campus of Milan Statale University and by a new hospital. For Italy, Expo Milan was not only a celebration of cultures or a way to raise the world's attention on food-related issues, but a catalyst for progress and innovation for the whole country. This is why Italy is bidding to host Expo 2030 in Roma with a theme which is the ideal continuation of that of Expo Osaka 2025. People and territories, urban regeneration, inclusion and innovation. I hope to see you all in Rome in seven years. As I come to the ending part of my speech, I realize that so far I told you what a country can do for young generations, what an educational system can do for young generation, what adults can do for young generation. But I would like to focus more on what young people can do for themselves. You are indeed invested with a great responsibility, that to understand the importance and accept the challenges to reach a high level of education and culture. It is estimated that within 2050, population will continue to dramatically rise in developing countries, changing not only the world demographics, but also the political and economic balance. Meanwhile, in aging societies such as Italy or Japan, young generation will be called upon to play a greater role in their communities. As baby boomers and Generation X will loosen their grab on decision making, it will be up to you to pick up the baton and give your contribution. The world we are leaving to you is complex. It is faster yet more fragile. It is more advanced yet more dangerous. And what is more, it brings with it some instincts buried in the ancestral soul of mankind. The fear of what is different. The arrogance of claiming our own lifestyle to be the best. The strive to secure resources in order to maximize our chance of survival. As we head towards a multipolar world, you will need to face and contrast these instincts, stand by the internationally accepted principles and rules, and try to make the right choices to achieve a sheer greater good. You will rely on the tools of the contemporary world, information, technology, but you will need culture in order to use them wisely. You will need to know those who exist close to you, to understand their points of view, to take into account their legitimate interests, and to encompass them in your vision of the world. If you will train your mind in this way from an early stage, you will be more successful in shaping a fairer world. My best wish for the future is that educated, smart, and responsible people will have the chance to stand out and do what is best for the global community. And I hope you will be among those. I thank Tohoku University for giving me the opportunity to address you, and I wish you all many years of success. Thank you very much for the video message, His Excellency, Mr. Gianluigi Benedetti. Please give a big hand. Thank you very much. Now we will prepare for the second part. So please wait for a moment. Thank you.
Distinguished professors, guests, and students, welcome to part two, the session of future directions of research and education of the social sciences and humanities. I am Sachiko Kiyama, Associate Professor at the Graduate School of Arts and Letters of Tohoku University, moderating the session. In the earlier session, as His Excellency Mr. Gianluigi Benedetti, Ambassador of the Italian Republic, delivered a thoughtful and insightful message to us, it is urgent to find out what adults and educational system can do for younger generations, as well as what young people can do for themselves, especially in difficult times such as the pandemic, the disaster, or the war. We academics of the social sciences and humanities are invested with a responsibility to propose a better ways to use art and culture when we rely on information and technology of the contemporary world. So in the current session, I am honored to introduce eight renowned professors. President Hideo Ono of Tohoku University. On his right, Professor Robert Tottori, Rector of L'Orientale University of Naples. Then, Professor Sharalyn Olberg from the University of British Columbia. Professor Harald Hus from Heidelberg University. Professor Matteo de Mastrangelo from the Sapienza University of Rome. Professor Albert de Jong from Leiden University. Professor Francis Tchek from Jagiellonian University and Professor Simon Suarez Quadros from the University of Granada. They are here on behalf of the 26 member universities of the Hasekura League and will speak to us about the significance of the social sciences and humanities in 21st century based on the current stage of research at their universities. So please join me in welcoming these knowledgeable and dedicated scholars. So now I would like to introduce the first speaker, Professor Hideo Ono, President of Tohoku University. So please proceed to the podium, Professor Ono. Well, thank you very much uh, for the introduction. Uh, once again, I'm Hideo Ono, or president of Tohoku University. So let me, um, well, first introduce who we are, and then uh, well, tell you a little bit about uh, the social science and humanities uh, activities that is going on uh, in Tohoku University, and touch upon uh, the future of uh, SSH, social science and humanities uh, at Tohoku University. Okay, um, our university was established uh, in 1907, 115 years ago, uh, as Tohoku Imperial University at the time. Uh, Tohoku University was a third university and the third national university following the University of Tokyo and uh, Kyoto University. Oh, next slide. Uh, here we go. Uh, at Tohoku University, the Faculty of Science uh, started to accept students first, and then the Faculty of Medicine, and then Faculty of Engineering. Well, during the period uh, immediately after its founding uh, of Tohoku University, there were two notable features, uh, one of which is shown here. One is that university took on the role of a research university in which researchers produced a string of original research uh, results that were then used in education and also in society. The second uh, feature is that we welcomed students with diverse educational backgrounds. Well, uh, you, you see on this slide uh, that we, in particular, we welcomed uh, female students since 
1913, well, despite the opposition of the Japanese government at the time. And this is a very uh, proud history of Tohoku University. Well, in addition, uh, we have also nurtured a spirit of applying cutting-edge research in society, as I already mentioned. Well, these three features of our university are idealized and as research first, open doors, well, in modern terms, encouraging diversity, and a practice-oriented research and education. Again, in modern language, uh, we say creating social values. They are the tenets that underline our activities at Tohoku University. For a time after its founding, Tohoku uh, University had only science and engineering related faculties. But in 1922, uh, the Faculty of Law and Letters, along uh, after long, uh, we wanted to have these uh, faculties for, for quite some time. Uh, finally, in 1922, the Faculty of Law and Letters was established for studies in social sciences and humanities. Well, the Faculty of Law and Letters was the genesis of today's social science and humanity department at Tohoku University. It was at this point that Tohoku University evolved to become a fully comprehensive university. This is why we consider 2022 this year to be the 100th anniversary of our becoming a comprehensive university. Well, in August 1945, uh, World War II ended and Japan's political system thereafter underwent a very drastic change. In 1949, the organization of universities and the entire education system were also revised. Well, since then, Tohoku University has continued to develop, and today it is one of Japan's leading uh, comprehensive research universities uh, with 10 faculties, 15 graduate schools, three professional graduate schools, six affiliated research institutes, and a number of uh, research centers. We have a total of 18,000 students, including undergraduates and graduates. Well, Tohoku University is very active in international exchange Currently, we have academic exchange agreements with 248 institutions in 36 countries and regions. There are 18,000 international, uh, 1,800 international students enrolled at the university. Well, the Hasekura League stands out among uh, the international networks. The ties generated by the league led to the creation of the International Graduate Program in Japanese Studies, as you see on the slide. What makes the program different from ex existing graduate schools is that it's aimed to foster students who can tackle contemporary issues with a global perspective, and that it is jointly operated by social sciences and humanities departments. Well, for us, at Tohoku University, the Great East Japan earthquake uh, that occurred in March 2011 is an unforgettable event. In particular, the Great East Japan earthquake caused extensive damage to the Pacific coast of Tohoku, where Tohoku University is located. We lost a total of 20,000 people. Well, the university also suffered major damage, mainly to its fa uh, facilities and equipment. Well, we, we will never forget the various help we received 
from many friends around the world. As a university that engages with society, we have con contributed to the reconstruction of the region from the immediate aftermath of the earthquake to this very present date. We have also established an international research institute, the International Research Institute for Disaster Science, to address how to prevent and mitigate damage caused by disasters, making full use of approaches from the perspective of social sciences and humanities. At Tohoku University, many researchers in the social sciences and humanities are practically addressing these issues by crossing the boundaries between disciplines and between the science and engineering and the social sciences and humanities. Well, Tohoku University has a must many academic assets. Uh, let me introduce some pieces from our humanities-related collection. Many are stored in the university library, which our international guests visited this morning. Well, Tohoku University is one of the few universities that possess national treasures. There are only three other national universities among 86. Our national treasures are the Shiki, records of the Grand Historian of China, and uh, Ruiju Kokshi, a historical text that categorizes and chronologizes the events, which are manuscripts from uh, the 11th and 12th centuries, respectively, as you can see on this slide. Okay. Um, these two national treasures are housed in the Kano collection. The Kano collection is a collection of over 100,000 classical books with an especially rich collection of materials related to uh, Edo period culture. We also hold the Soseki Library. Soseki Natsume was one of, the, one of Japan's leading novelists and intellectuals in the early 1900. He is probably the most famous writer in Japan. In the Sosik Library are about 3,000 items, which include his books, manuscripts, and diaries. The Kano Collection and the Sosik Library are top-class academic assets in Japanese cultural studies. Well, our plan is to promote digital humanities, making these assets digital, and to build on them national as well as international projects. Under the banner of our connected university strategy, as you see on the slide, the university's activities will be expanded and merged into cyberspace which allows us to overcome many barriers, like time and space. Taking advantage of the strengths that Tohoku University possesses as comprehensive university, we will bring together academic knowledge from such areas as information science and data-driven science with researchers in the social sciences and humanities at the core of our activities. We are considering calling it the Tohoku University project to explore knowledge in spatio-temporal. Well, we expect that the wide variety of accumulated academic assets will be digitized. Then these data can be linked and compared around the world using digital technology to produce new results and insights. New knowledge that leads us to future society will undoubtedly be undoubtedly be generated. Well, as a start, we would very much like to promote cooperation in the field of digital archiving and joint research based on it with the universities in the Hasekura League. Together with you, Tohoku University uh, aims to create knowledge and social values for a global future society. So that concludes my uh, presentation. Thank you very much.
So, Professor Ono, thank you so much for the presentation. It sounds fascinating. So next, it is our great honor to welcome Professor Roberto Tottoli, Rector of L'Orientale University of Naples, Italy. So Professor Tottoli, would you proceed? First of all, thank you, Mr. President, to all university, to this invitation and the possibility to be, to be here. I have a video presenting my university and then some slides of consideration about uh, the future of humanities and social sciences. My university, L'Orientale in Naples, has its beginning as Collegio dei Cinesi, Chinese college. It was founded by Matteo Ripa, a priest coming from the southern region where Napoli is and where there is also a countryside owned by him. He was a, a lay priest, a missionary worker, and uh, he had a success staying in China because I was uh, a very good uh, Cooper engraver, a part of being a, mission, a Catholic missionary. When uh, he returned in Naples after more than 10 years in China, he had four young Chinese men with him, and uh, he, they, they somehow colored Naples and also the countryside where, from where Ripa came, where we, we still have some uh, streets named something like Chinese streets, uh, according to these Chinese. The Pope in Rome granted official recognition in 1732, and this is the date of birth of the University of Naples L'Orientale, and the objectives were to train young Chinese people to prepare people as interpreters of the languages of China and Indian, and as such, L'Orientale in Naples was the first uh, European institution which uh, was born as uh, devoted to the study of Asian languages and literature. Later on, also young people coming from the close by Ottoman Empire, Albanians, Bosnian, Bulgars, Greeks, uh, and even from the Middle East, uh, were also accepted to the college, uh, strictly connected to religious culture and uh, education. So, uh, during the period of this time, that it is the first half of the 18th century until 1888, uh, it was a group of lay priests, the congregation of the Sacred Family of Jesus Christ, who, we, who provided the education for both college students and also other people joining the college to learn the languages. And it was only after the unification of Italy, uh, and exactly in the year just after it, in 1868, that the Collegio dei Cinesi, Chinese college, was transformed into the Royal Asiatic College and divided into two distinct sections, one responsible for the missionary work and the new one offering courses to young people, lay people, interested in studying Asian and African languages, and also along with this, also with Balkan, uh, Eastern Europe languages. And finally, uh, with a decree by the young Italian unitary state, the Royal Asiatic College became known uh, as Istituto Orientale, a name which was changed only 20 years ago as Università di Napoli uh, L'Orientale. Uh, this last reform was important because it uh, brought to a closure of a missionary program in our university, and uh, after the unification of Italy, and also before the accord with a pontifical state, it became a completely lay institution, a state university. And today, L'Orientale, Università di Napoli L'Orientale, University of Naples, uh, 
Orientale is the oldest school teaching Asian and African uh, languages in Italy, having now six degree undergraduate programs and nine graduate master programs, ranging in different disciplines from archaeology, Asian and African studies, comparative literature, and also adding all European American studies, somehow with an ideal proposal to cover as many as possible studies in all the languages of the world. Additionally, additionally uh, L'Orientale University offers free PhD programs uh, which are closely related to these different interests, research interests. One is uh, also uh, coming close to the name of one of the three departments of uh, L'Orientale. It's devoted to Asian, African, and Mediterranean studies mostly devoted to philological and ancient studies of the cultures, one mostly devoted to international contemporary studies in the fields of history, history of thought, geopolitics, economic, institutional uh, over, um, uh, matters. The third one is on literary, linguistic, and comparative studies, mostly devoted to European and American languages and literatures, so how am I covering about Europe and America. Uh, these three different departments and PhD programs can count on a bibliographic collection of uh, almost 700,000 units, uh, now, in, uh, this, the, according to three different sections, uh, collecting books of all these areas and also an historical collection. Uh, Corigliano Palace, which is one of historical buildings of Orientale, it's the place of this PhD program and department on Asian and African studies. You have also an over building. We are in Naples downtown, so these historical buildings are mostly from 16th century. And Giusto Pala is the one devoted to international law, international study, history, and so on. And the Nova Historical Palace is where the program and the department in literature and comparative literature, Maria Portacelli, and the one devoted to Europe, Western and Eastern Europe, and North American and South America. As you know and understand from the Navy, the city of Naples is where L'Orientale University is, and which is a very ancient and colorful town. And uh, somehow, uh, since the beginning, according to uh, its vocation, L'Orientale is uh, particularly engaged in uh, international cultural relations with hundreds, uh, I would say almost 500 uh, cooperation and uh, memorandum of understanding, understanding with, with universities coming from all the continents, in particular Asia and Africa. Uh, we are collaborating with uh, these hundreds of uh, universities and uh, we are covering many, many topics uh, coming, going from archaeology and uh, coming finally to uh, contemporary interne international studies. Somehow the project of university is uh, the capability to uh, combine the study of the ancient uh, legacy and heritage with uh, modern and contemporary studies. I come now to the PowerPoint. Okay. Okay. After this uh, brief and running presentation, let me come to what is the situation now and for the future and how L'Oriental in Naples and as many other universities are facing the challenges of today and of the future. We think and my university thinks that we, uh, the need of sharing knowledge and competencies with uh, STEM uh, disciplines, hard sciences, and the promoting of interdisciplinarity are fundamental. But we are also convinced that uh, cultural diversity all over the world is more in need than in the past of the skills coming from social sciences and humanities. I, we, I and we think that promoting academic exchange that values diversity is fundamental in, these, in the world today and also in the world of the future. This world appears day after day more interconnected 
ensure the digital tools that were and are largely used during the pandemic have further increased this general feeling. But to face global challenges, we need, along with uh, more than technical tools, to create the possibility for people to talk to each other, understand each other, and share meanings. I'm sure, I believe that uh, social sciences and humanities are the tool par excellence in that. For sake of all this, coordinating with other academies and universities is fundamental is really the major key in this. We as Orientale are in many European alliances, according to the new programs of European unity, to share the university experiences all over European countries, but we are eager to join a truly global league going beyond the European unity. What L'Orientale can bring in this now and in the near future to recall to your attention and to the attention of the colleagues here. We are increasing the number of the languages we teach uh, with the usual specific attention to Asia and Africa, which is our core business and our history, and in which we are one of the major centers in Europe. We are increasing position scholarship and PhD, and every possibility to involve younger people in languages, but also you know, dealing with cultures, uh, history, history of religions, international relations, with the aim that uh, combining the study of languages with what is around culture is fundamental to knowing each other. We are acquiring also two more buildings in Naples to create a more comfortable space for students and researchers, relying about those programs mentioned by the ambassador of Italy of an increasing amount of uh, uh, money and financial aid to develop education and university system in Italy, such as in Europe. And uh, in one of these buildings, our idea, idea, I hope it will uh, happen soon in the next year to creating uh, a world culture center attractive for students and researchers from all over the world, uh, collecting not only a library but uh, research lines involving the crossing all, all these competencies regarding places in the world. For sake of this, L'Orientale promotes the exchange of scholars and students with other universities in Europe and around the world. And to this end, we have created a specific new program for visiting researchers and scholars. L'Orientale, I think, as every institution here, considers it essential to keep the channels of communication with academic community open at all times, despite continuing international crisis. We are facing all the time political crisis. Now we are in a time of war at the borders of Europe to keep the channel of communication with all institutions, also with the countries at war is fundamental to sharing knowledge and the capability to build a future peaceful relation between countries and peoples. Oriental is enriching in this direction its undergraduate and graduate courses with new disciplines and teachings, but above all, with an interdisciplinary intent, aware that the future lies in sharing knowledge and sharing skills with hard sciences and technical skills. L'Orientale for this is a, typical, is a typical university only devoted to social sciences and humanities and makes absolutely of the relevance of them in the contemporary and future society its core business. The studies of languages and related culture is the way to develop skills to permitting our students, first of all, to be citizens of the world and to be able to vehicle respect for the others through the knowledge of the value and specificity and specific value of every culture. Both the University of Oriental as a whole and its departments share the conviction that uh, humanities are the key for this knowledge. And the challenge winning and informed technical knowledge is a future only in combination with ethical and culturally conscious awareness. And these interdisciplinary attitudes must be accompanied by a specific attention to studying abroad and with implementation of programs promoting periods of study in the, in the continents by our and all students around the world. We are investing a significant amount of resources in these programs in coordination with other universities and also with university in Africa and Asia. And we want to enrich these in every direction with a conviction that studying, but above all, living abroad, 
are fundamental experience for the knowledge of other people and cultures. I guess that being conscious of this, we are also enriching our attractivity for foreign students, and we are also proposing our students to share experience abroad in Japan, like everywhere in the world. Orientale too is working at a national level and local level to create opportunities in this direction to foreign students to come to our university to study. What can L'Orientale offer now and in the near future for foreign students to come and to share this view of interdisciplinarity and inter interaction with uh, people and students from different countries? I guess, first of all, a vibrant and iconic city close to the most important archaeological sites. You have here an exhibition on Pompeii. We are close to Pompeii. And the museums of all Italy connected, very well connected to other towns. A unique disciplinary offer in Italy, English, and the language is taught. Now in L'Orientale, we are teaching almost uh, 60 languages according with curricular and laboratory languages where to learn about the many cultures of the world, and I guess a welcoming and living place and a community of teachers, scholars, and students with whom to exchange knowledge and experiences, which is more important, in one of the most beautiful places in the world. And I stop here. Thank you for your attention, and see you in Naples, I hope, soon. Thank you. Thank you so much for the captivating speech, Professor Tottori. Third, we would like to call upon Professor Sharaline Oberg, Department Head of Asian Studies at the University of British Columbia, Canada. So please proceed, Professor Oberg. Well, I'm very honored and delighted to be here today as part of the Hasekura Summit. Uh, I'm representing the University of British Columbia, known as UBC. And today I will mostly be talking about the Faculty of Arts within the University of UBC. And then I'm going to have some students speak for themselves about what our university has to offer. First, some general figures about the university. It was founded in 1908, so it's just a little bit younger than Tohoku University. We have 44,000 students on one of our campuses, the main campus in Vancouver. So it's a very large university that includes uh, both graduate and undergraduate students. And UBC is Canada's most international university. It's located in Vancouver, one of the world's most beautiful and most multicultural cities. And here's, here it is, this is the campus. Our buildings are certainly not as distinguished as those in Naples or in most of the universities that will be introduced to you today, but our mountains are older than their buildings. UBC is known for commitment to environmental sustainability, global connections, innovation, and student-centered learning. And I'm going to come back in a moment to what that means. Within UBC, we have the Faculty of Arts. Some facts and figures about the Faculty of Arts. It's the largest faculty at UBC with 13,000 undergraduate students and some number of graduate students that I did not check. Um, we have over 70 options for major and minor studies within the Faculty of Arts. And we host students from over 120 countries. 
There are 27 departments in the faculty, such as economics, music, Asian studies, history, geography, gender, race, and social justice, anthropology, the iSchool, which is where we teach information science and data management, journalism, sociology, ancient Mediterranean and Near Eastern studies, linguistics, philosophy, critical indigenous studies, and about 15 others. The faculty is divided into three sectors, humanities, social sciences, and the creative and performing arts. And today I'm not going to talk about the third sector at any length, but would like to point out that we have several museums, theaters, galleries, and auditoriums. Today's focus is on humanities and the social sciences. And the question that I was asked to address um, in, in today's talk is, why study the social sciences and humanities? What are they good for? Well, to answer that question, I would like to introduce the president of our university, Mr. S or Dr. Santoro Ono, a Japanese-Canadian scientist who has this to say about the humanities. I believe that I am a better scholar because of my liberal arts education, because it was intentionally diverse and heterogeneous, because it made me move outside of my comfort zone into areas of thought and discussion that were uncomfortable to me. It broadened my mind. It exercised my mind. Of course, there are many, many sorts of topics that you can study in the humanities and social sciences, but those areas allow you, in general, to address multiple, multiple perspectives and global histories, cultural and linguistic diversity, and places, including the deep history of the place where UBC stands. You see here a, a statue, a pole, that we call the Musqueam Pole, um, because the University of British Columbia stands on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. For thousands of years on this land, the Musqueam people, one of the First Nations of Canada, have lived and worked and learned and passed down knowledge to the next generation. So the faculty and students at UBC, we are honored to continue that work of passing down knowledge to the next generation on the land of the Musqueam people together with them. We consider that, a, uh, that to take seriously our relationship with the indigenous people of what we now call Canada, both in the past and in the present, is fundamentally important for building a just and sustainable society for the future. What kinds of experiences do you have when you study social sciences and humanities? Well, you create social connections through clubs, sports, residence, campus activities, and so on. We have many opportunities for developing job skills and professional networks. There are many work opportunities for students, both on campus and through cooperative uh, organizations with um, different kinds of businesses in the community. There's also community engagement, where you can volunteer to work with different kinds of associations, non-governmental associations, both locally and globally, while studying at UBC. And of course, in the classroom where we emphasize transformative learning. What kind of skills can you develop through social, social sciences and humanities study? Some of the very important skills that would be necessary in the coming years that you develop through these areas are communication, effective argumentation, critical thinking, problem solving, research, analysis and synthesis, and media literacy. And then what are the benefits of a social sciences and humanities education? Well, the faculty at UBC engage in research collaborations with thousands, literally thousands, of universities around the world, including many in Japan. So we are developing global networks of intellectual exchange. For students, 
it's very easy at UBC to connect with faculty research and then to become a part of those research networks, uh, globally speaking. So as we face global challenges such as climate change, migration, unequal distribution of wealth, and other problems, connections, conversations, and collaborations are key to constructing a sustainable and more equitable world, we believe, at UBC. Here's another view of the lovely campus. But now I'm going to turn to a video where students from UBC are going to speak to you about their own experiences, about what it means for them to study at UBC. So especially for those of you in the audience who are students, I hope this will be a useful, um, some useful information. At UBC Arts, you can create a flexible degree experience that meets your unique personal, academic, and career goals. We offer over 90 undergraduate program options. Arts is the largest faculty at UBC with more than 25 departments, schools, institutes, and programs. We have students from over 120 countries worldwide. Explore over 2,000 courses bought by over 1,000 scholars who are leaders in their fields. UBC Arts gives out more than $2 million in annual prizes, scholarships, and awards. Depending on your major or minor, up to half of your classes will be electives. This gives you a lot of freedom to explore topics that interest you, from languages and music to pop culture and current events. Learning at UBC Arts also happens outside of the classroom. There are many opportunities for undergraduates to engage with research, including research-intensive courses, participating in undergraduate research conferences and journals, and working alongside researchers at the university. It's Rachel, and I'm a fourth-year psychology student with a minor in health and society. Currently, I'm working as a lab manager and a research assistant in Francis Chen's social health lab. I'm also a work learning student here in the department as a communications and web coordinator. So I'm pretty integrated here in the department. Um, I basically live in the Kenny building. I think being an RA is a super valuable experience because you not only get to put all those 217, 218 skills to use, um, but you learn how to run a study. Um, you can learn how to use different programs like R and SPSS. You learn just how the world of research works um, and you meet new people. So what's better than that? In the Arts Co-op program, you can explore your career options while gaining paid professional work experience and a new network of contacts. Hi, my name is Irvin. I'm a fifth year honors sociology student and I'm also in the Arts Co-op program. Arts Co-op is a program that gives you the opportunity to gain paid job experience while developing new skills and fostering the ones that you learn in the classroom and through extracurriculars. It also thoughtfully teaches you how to apply and search for jobs, which is a really useful skill to learn. I previously worked as the marketing coordinator with the Vancouver Queer Film Festival and had an amazing time connecting with Vancouver's local LGBTQ2 community. Currently, I work as a communications specialist for a tech company called SAP, where I support internal communications for our employees in Vancouver and across Canada. My favorite part about Arts Co-op is the ability to explore a variety of sectors, from nonprofit to public and private, and a plethora of industries in between. You can really get a sense of which areas of work you thrive in, which is a really important thing to learn about yourself. Being in the Arts Co-op program is as much about self-discovery as it is about gaining useful job experience. My co-op experiences have allowed me to gain new skills and have prepared me for potential careers after graduating. I've also become more willing to take on challenges that push me outside of my comfort zone. More importantly, I'm finding ways in which I can take the experiences and knowledge from my classes and involvement on campus and apply them to create impact in communities and spaces outside of UBC. 
As you enter the UBC Arts community, your peers and profs want to share some advice. My name is Ruhi. I'm a third year theater design and production student here at UBC. A great way to make the most of your first year at UBC is by being open to new experiences. So join that club, take that interesting elective, and make sure to enjoy everything UBC has to offer. Hi everyone, my name is Tiffany Lee. I use the pronouns she, her, and hers, and I'm a fifth year student in the Faculty of Arts. Something that I absolutely love about UBC is that there's endless opportunities for your personal and professional development. I like to say that there's a community for everyone at UBC. You can meet like-minded friends in special interest clubs, you can build your work experience through things like co-op, and you can travel the world through Go Global. I've had an amazing experience in taking advantage of a lot of these opportunities, and it's been so enriching in connecting me with lifelong friends and mentors, as well as building my resume for post-graduation opportunities. University is such an exciting journey to embark on, and if I can give you any advice on behalf of a humble university student's experience, I can only say to make sure you get as much out of it as possible and experience as much as you can. University is really what you make out of it. Four to five years sounds like a long time, but it flies by so quickly, so make the most of it. I hope you'll join the UBC Arts community. It was the best decision I ever made, and I hope it will be for you too. My name is uh, Michael, and I teach Ancient Greek Philosophy in the Departments of Classics and Philosophy at UBC. I was born and raised in Vancouver and in one of the little Gulf Islands close to here, and I was almost a computer scientist at UBC before I tried out my elective in classics and loved it. I didn't know what I wanted to do when I started at UBC either, and I think I'd suggest trying lots of different things to start, so take some electives. Um, discover what you genuinely enjoy. If you really enjoy something, then you'll probably get good at it. And if you get really good at something, it'll probably stay with you for life. Uh, it might help in your career, your experience of the world and making a difference in it. So I'd say try different things and, and do what you love. My name is Devon. I'm a second year Bachelor of International Economics student. For the most of your first year at UBC, don't be afraid to seek out any of the opportunities around you. Seek out a mentor, get to know a professor, attend sessions at your career center, and uh, most importantly, don't neglect your health. Hi there, my name is Stephen. I'm a second year student here at UBC studying psychology. Um, one of the things that I really, really love about UBC that you're probably gonna notice when you first get here is how beautiful the campus is. You've heard it before. I am not kidding. It is absolutely breathtaking to the point that whenever I'm like stressed, I just, go outside and I look at the campus and it really does help me. And aside from that, what I really love about UBC as well is the amount of support that you will get from your profs and your faculty and like your department. I have found it really helpful. In high school, they tell you things like, oh, your profs won't care about you. That is lies. <laughs> my profs have been absolute like angels and they've helped my transition from high school to university so much. And also my second year, it's been so amazing just to have that kind of support. Advice that I would give you would probably be time management. Um, and I know that's something you've probably heard of a thousand times before, but please, please get a journal and write down every assignment that you have to do at the beginning of the year. And I promise you, it'll make your transition all the more less anxiety inducing. Hi, my name is Sunny Wang. I teach Chinese language. One fun fact about me is that in my undergrad, I majored in nursing. At a point in my life, all I wanted to be was a pediatric nurse. I would say my experience in dealing with the kids in the past definitely helped me with being a good professor to more kids, only bigger. My advice for students who do not exactly know what they want to study is to find what you are really passionate about. Ask yourself, what keeps you up at night? And what makes you get up early in the morning with a smile? That's what you are passionate about. Step out of your comfort zone and try something new. You may find a new and amazing path that you never thought to embark on before. I'm a simple
Thanks for watching. For more information about the faculty and our programs, please visit arts.ubc.ca. Yes, thank you for watching. Um, as you see, this is what I meant by student-centered university. We have many flexible options for students to uh, create a, a study path that is your own, where you get a chance to explore various areas before you choose a major and focus in. And we are very student-centered. We like to hear what students have to say. So thank you very much. Okay, Professor Oberg, thank you so much for the exciting presentation where many students appeared. Okay. So then, as the fourth speaker, we are pleased to have Professor Harald Huss, Director of the Heidelberg Graduate School of Humanities and Social Sciences, Heidelberg University, Germany. So Professor Huss, Please start. I am very honored to be here, and I want to congratulate Tohoku University on its 115th anniversary and the faculties of law and letters through their 100 years' existence. In fact, um, my university and Tokyo University almost share the same motto. Semper apertus means always open. Now, it not meant to be open doors. In our case, meant to be open books. Books in the good old days was what humanities were supposed to be doing, reading those books. Now, unlike Tokyo universities, we did not have women students after six years it took us about 500 years to accept female students, named the year 1900. So Tokyo University is far more progressive than Heidelberg University was. The second motto of my university was a slogan that our current PR um, people have given us is future since 1386. So when I'm talking about the future of humanities, I can safely go into the past. Now, this being said, yes, we are an old university, and just to explain that universities sometimes are born out of crises. Heidelberg University essentially exists because another university no longer existed or had a problem. Namely, we are a child of Paris University. Now, you wonder, what does France and Germany have in common at the time? It is because Europe has religion, just like other places, but Europe was not always agreeing on its religion. Even before it had Protestantism or Orthodoxy, Europe at the time had two popes. So the scholars of Paris University who did not like the French pope in Avignon had to go elsewhere, and they were given the opportunity to start a new university in the city capital of the Duke Elector in Heidelberg. So the head of the Paris University, the rector, so to speak, Marsilius von Ingen, was beginning with a faculty of four faculties, very typical of the time. Now, what would be the four typical faculties be at the time? Theology, law, medicine, and philosophy. So what does a university do in the good Middle Ages? It trains two types of people, priests and bureaucrats or state officials. And one of the quirky things that I found out of my university that I didn't know, I think up to the 15th century, teachers were not permitted to be married. After all, they were supposed to be focusing themselves on learning. This is not untypical of European universities. I think Oxford, finally, in the 19th century, um, scholars were permitted to get married. So there are things in development in which learning and religion were connected. And the high days of Heidelberg essentially ended in another crisis, the crisis of the Thirty Years' War, 1618 to 1648, ended that university, and it changed its high days of Protestant catechism to become more or less taken over by the French, who were kind of burning Heidelberg, 
And when you go to the city today, you will still find a castle on the hill, and the castle is a ruin. It has never been rebuilt ever since. The university did survive and was taken over by the Jesuits. So the Jesuits were having a different form of religious instruction until more or less the university stopped existing at the end of Napoleonic Wars because it had lost all its land and property on the other side of the Rhine. Now these are all quirks of European history of conflict, of learning. So the Heidelberg of today is a 19th century invention. It has two elements. One is romanticism. So the philosopher's path, the literature, the poetry, and political liberalism. So political liberalism, student movements, um, the German first parliament of 1848, many Heidelberg professors were part of that. So that entire invigoration. Now, the one thing I can always impress American deans um, by my university, we have something that is very unusual at the university. Now, this is an odd way to recruit students, but if you walk up the stairs to the university rector's office, as usual, we have these pictures of Nobel Prize winning men. But what students don't know, under the stairs, there are student jails. So when students were drinking too much or being too loud, they were given a few days of rest. And there is now a museum of student poetry on the walls where they were writing um, all kinds of dif indifferential things um, about the world, about their teachers, um, about their girlfriends um, that has become a student kind of museum almost. And above the student prison today, one of the Japanese universities has a liaison office. Um, so it's an odd combination of quirky things that you do have in places with history. But in academic terms, what did Heidelberg do between the middle of the 19th century to World War I is establish the research university as we know it today. The American John Hopkins University that graduate school was a model on Heidelberg. Now, our university president always tells us, and I don't believe it, but we invented the university campus. Whenever I look at the dates, I'm like, what? The first campus we have in 1860, I'm sure the Harvard and Yale had earlier campuses. Um, nevertheless, we do have a coherent set of um, buildings in, in the field of medicine, but Many of the buildings are in an old town, um, all within pedestrian paths, um, and lots of history, and lots of restaurants, and um, a, a vibrant kind of community. But we are a very small town. So it's very much a small city charm, and many students today would say, I want to be in the biggest city possible. Heidelberg has 140,000 inhabitants, 20,000 students, 8,000 staff, about 500 full professors. So we are fairly small by that standard. So let me go to the... Oop. So instead of buildings, I'm showing you people now. I can't name those people, but what you find is the vibrancy in a university. And when I was listening to the UBC presentation, I thought, ah, if I were an undergraduate, I now want to go to Canada and study there. Um, there's, of course, the catch of tuition fees um, in North American universities, but we heard about it, two million um, scholarships. There is one thing about many European universities, including Germans, they're free. You don't pay tuition fees if you're continental Europe. Now, they change it a little bit for the non-Europeans, but it's still usually about 1,000 euro of tuition fee. So free tuition, education. The only thing you have to do is learn German. Now, is that worth it? <laughs> In the good old days, it was. Japanese came to Europe, whether they're called Modi, Oga, or others, to learn German because they wanted to learn about philosophy, 
about medicine, about chemistry, about other sciences. This being said, Heidelberg did progress a little bit at the level of MA or PhD degrees. Instruction, especially in the sciences, is also in English. And a third of our PhD students are from other nationalities um, across the board. So we are Germany's oldest research university. I'm showing you this kind of room that is our huggy hole, if so to speak. Um, it is only a 19th century building, but it's pretty impressive and very heavy on history. And one of the rituals we have is young professors have to go there and give a presentation to introduce themselves like Jiko Shukai. Um, and it's very much all the history is on your shoulders when you do that. So um, th there is this intergenerational knowledge transfer logic to it. Um, within Germany, there are these kind of competitive moments. You have that in Japan too, you have that in other systems. Because we are a national or state-funded university. We don't have endowments. We have to compete to help our students to get an education. And in that designation, Heidelberg has been successful in so-called excellence initiative in the last series, and we're just preparing for the next version of that next year. Fundamentally, we are probably very strong in, medicine, in clinical medicine or technical medicine, subjects that are not of relevance to us here today, classical natural science, astronomy, physics, but humanities. Humanities and the Faculty of Philosophy, we have subjects like Egyptology, Assyriology, um, Archaeology, of course, Latin, Classical Greek philosophy. Um, we had some um, famous people of the late 19th century that all of you, even if you're not uh, familiar with natural, uh, social science, like Max Weber, you may have heard of. He had a brother called Alfred Weber, less knowledgeable, but in the field of economics. Um, and so on. So there are a few people in the good old days, but even in the post-war period we had. Um, so that Heidelberg University, I looked at the ranking issues that Japanese like to um, know about. It's usually top 100 universities, um, plus, minus. Munich universities are also strong in Germany in these rankings. But the quirky ones I found interesting. I didn't believe it, but I saw it. New York Times is my source the 12th highest university in the world in terms of employability. So if you learn German, you can get employment worldwide on the 12th position, right? Um, and the other one is the Nobel Prize winners on the 12th position. So it's easy to remember 12 on these two paradigms of um, bragging rights. Now, we are probably still research-based graduate studies compared to the other German universities. We have relatively few undergraduates and lots of MA doctoral students. The other universities in our state are still famous, like Tübingen, Freiburg, Karlsruhe, um, are research universities. But um, we probably, because of that emphasis, maybe um, the large in that section, the international outlook, I have the picture. It doesn't have our current president of Tokyo University, but it was a previous meeting of the so-called Hexagon Alliance. So. There is a collaboration with three Japanese universities, Kyodai, Handai, and Tohokudai, with two other German universities across the sciences. And this across the sciences theme is something I want to bring up again in the rest of my presentation. Now, having talked about the macro picture, and I want to go to the micro. Micro in the sense of this is only Japan. This is our Japan research capability, just happened to be the um, faces of my colleagues who work with Japanese research material. Um, and just to give you a sense of what we are doing is written kind of underneath, but I want to introduce a guy with a beard. He's easy to remember, right? He speaks eight languages. Um, he's from New Zealand. He has a PhD from Harvard. And he is our colleague in Buddhist studies. Now, this is very classical. But we talked about digital humanities that Tokyo University wants to build up. He is using digital humanities databases for research. Looking at Sanskrit, Chinese, and Japanese classical texts, the things that you can read 
but that has never been compared on an aggregate large scale to find out who has copied from whom. What is the development of ideas? What can you find that has not been found by other tools? How can you trace the development? So how digital humanities is changing our knowledge is one of the ways he's looking at. And maybe another person I want to point out is a woman in literature. Now literature, you all assume it, someone who is able to read and interpret texts. What she's also doing with her digital humanities collaboration with the Japanese universities is looking at the geography of poetry in Japan. Where were the things um, mentioned, produced, mapped out? How are they connected? Um, so it's using a new tool um, in a classical field. So each one of us are playing in, in different direction. Um, I'm probably the least innovative on the digital humanities side. But th these are the so-called full professors. Unlike other systems, we also have the um, younger people who don't have a permanent position, that therefore they come and go more frequently. But we do have, for example, Japanese colleagues who work at our university. And when you see on the bottom, job destination of graduates, Kyodai, Kyodai, um, Tohokudai, Berlin, and so on and so forth, um, they do leave Germany wildly, and they have the opportunity to get elsewhere um, once they come um, even in the Japanese studies field. Now, how would you get the macro and the micro together? And what does that mean for the development and the future of humanities and social sciences? Now, very often, the traditional humanities project is a smart individual has great ideas, writes the philosophy that is influencing many, many people. And all they need is free time to do so. In other subjects, Finding new um, knowledge is very much a collaborative enterprise. You have large research team that work together with certain kind of tools to come up with new forms of knowledge. Um, currently, for example, I'm looking at nuclear um, weapons research in Japan, so nuclear power research, you know, the atomic project, many, many people work together to get um, these results. So, what Heidelberg has been doing in the last 12 or so years is trying to mobilize the individual strength in institutional collaboration. And the outcome is something new. New that it still uses all the things we know about humanities, our deep language skills, to create new interdisciplinary knowledge. And we call it transcultural studies. So transcultural studies, you will say, what is different between transcultural and area studies? It's all about culture, right? But putting cultures in dialogue, putting subjects in dialogue, not only at the theoretical level, but in practice of our teaching. So here, we have also created a center with 25 professors, 2,000 students. And we're able to build four new buildings and what I show you, the picture, is a library. It looks like a metal construction in a hole. It's our digital humanities library. So we got together, did one of the grant applications, said natural researchers, they have a big tool. Our big tool is digital humanities. And that's what we're going to go work around. And we started with MA and PhD programs in English. And they're still are tuition free, um, most of them. Now, we have moved on from transcultural studies, which still exists. So transforming cultural heritage is one of the core flagship projects of the university, combining some of the traditional ancient society humanities with some of the heritage preservation work people were doing, for example, in India. We have a new graduate program over multi-years funding, um, every year 10 um, scholarships for PhD students. It's called ambivalent enmities. Now, I think you all know what an enemy is, um, but what is ambivalent about enmity? How can they be historic, how can it be interesting as a research subject? So we have colleagues who work on Middle Eastern studies, um, for example, who say, 
You know, some of the Israeli-Arab conflict, they very much closely study who the enemies are, and they then also imitate what they hate the most by dealing with that. And you have many of those binary relationships, Pakistan and India, where that um, development of you almost become that what you hate the most in mimicry type ritualized functions, but you're very much engaged in it. The second thing I want to mention is our center for apocalyptic studies. Now, we had a Naraku conference here, which is a Buddhist hell. Um, in Heidelberg, apocalypse um, has already arrived. Um, and the center for apocalyptic and post-apocalyptic studies is how do humans deal with existential fear? How do they overcome that? Um, and how do you study that? Very much, again, interdisciplinary um, a research center. We have 10 scholarship every year um, for people to come every year from all kinds of places um, to work on that. And maybe the third thing that is not on the thing here, it's institutionalized, and that will also be interesting for Tokyo University maybe, our professors can join in research teams, social science humanities with natural science. And what we have to do is, we have to work together for one year on a project where we do less teaching, but we work on these projects together. And very often, out of this collaboration, we end up having new research projects like health humanities. Um, currently, I'm working in, with colleagues in public health, for example, to also include Japan in that larger project and so forth. And it's something where we can really talk to each other academically beyond the administrative level at the university. Um, innovation in education. We have a graduate school with six faculties included, including the Faculty of Philosophy. But what we've done, what I have not seen before, is joint degrees education. So we had the first MA between a European and a Japanese university, the MA in Transcultural Studies with Kyoto University. But our inspiration, in fact, was Tokyo University with the Faculty of Law, a, P, a joint or double doctorate um, with Heidelberg University Faculty of Philosophy. Um, and we then expanded that through a PhD with Kafoskari in Venice. Um, so several people every year are recruited um, and we have the first graduates in, in both um, levels. And those people, because they have double doctorates, can look for jobs more easily in European and the Asian world. So it's real institutional innovation that I don't see happening at that scale elsewhere in the humanities. So opportune threat in a deglobalization age. When we started 12 years ago, it seems transcultural studies was so obvious that there would be no turning back. Now, COVID and the war between Russia and Ukraine has questioned some of those basic assumptions. Student flow has been disrupted in a way I had never thought possible. And whether some of the global chain of communication will be fixed, I cannot tell. There are, however, improvements. Online forms of communication will probably be used more universally, not only in the classroom, but also in research. We have not yet figured out as universities how to integrate that in our administrative systems. But I hope it will be used effectively to enhance education instead of cutting faculty positions. After all, you can now say, do your online class elsewhere. We no longer need to provide the manpower to teach you. So it, I don't know how it will turn out. So the future can go both ways. So what are the most desirable innovations? I would say interdisciplinary international work that is effective and that really is research driven. We are looking for common knowledge, that common problems that we want to tackle and that our institutions give us the freedom to do so. And by almost extension, we can excite our students with our teaching, with our knowledge, with our questions to join us in that enterprise and to inspire us for future research. Thank you very much.
Okay, thank you so much for your insightful speech, Professor Horst. So now we may need a short break for 10 minutes, uh, although it is a little bit delayed. So the other professor's presentations will start at 14.55. Thank you.
ットを巻きますMr. President, honor, distinguished guests, esteemed colleagues, TIA students, so it's better to say Korekarano Gakse, members of the Tohoku University community, it is a great pleasure for me to be here on behalf of Sapienza for the Hasekura Summit and for the celebration of the 150th anniversary of the founding of Tohoku University. That is a superb institution with excellence in so many areas. I would like to offer my deepest thanks to Mr. President Ono for the kind invitation and for having proposed the Asekura Statement. In order to discuss the current state of research in the humanities and social sciences in my university, I would like to start with a brief video on, on Sapienza in general before presenting the Faculty of Arts and Humanities.
As you have seen in the video, Sapienza is organized into 11 faculties, each of which oversees various departments. The Faculty of Arts and Humanities is dedicated to cultural heritage, archaeology, historical, anthropological and artistic studies, classical and contemporary languages and literature, philology and so on. As for the entire Sapienza, the largest university in Europe and one of the oldest with its history of 700 years, the faculty pursued the mission of contributing to the development of knowledge of society through research, quality education and international cooperation. The most influential university rankings worldwide place Sapienza among the first Italian university for its research and international dimension in particular the QS uh, World University Rankings by subject, published on April 6, 2022, confirms Sapienza's first place worldwide in classics and ancient history. The first nucleus of Faculty of Arts and Humanities was founded in 1870 and was formed by some important schools as the School of Oriental Studies. As it is true for all university, historical and social movements have resulted in many changes. During the fascist years, for instance, the Institute of Albanian Studies, the one of Roman philology, classical archaeology and Roman history were established. The post-war period and the student movements asked for a less elitist university for Italy as for Japan. In other words, the scientific and cultural structures of the whole humanistic area were rapidly changing all over the world. And in Italy too, the cultural industry required different maps in, and hierarchy of knowledge. As a result, old and prestigious disciplines lost their traditional centrality, while order acquired increasing importance and eventually academic legitimacy. The study of all foreign languages and literature has become more important as the international dimension becomes central and the popularity of modern oriental languages greatly increased. Today, every institution has many instruments to monitor how and in which direction the students' choices change it. However, apart from the instrumental use of statistics, it is very interesting to study how the university changes reflect social and cultures one. The Faculty of Art and Humanity now consists of six departments and offers 18 bachelor degree, uh, two of them courses, two of them taught in English, it is classics and global humanities, and 18 master's degree courses, four of them taught in English. The mission of developing the social science and humanities in a perspective of inclusivity and interdisciplinary is a target on which we are working continuously. In the latest years, some new courses were clearly born with these goals in mind. I would like to introduce some examples of these new courses. For instance, the course of Global Humanities that aims at providing students with knowledge and competences in the fields of humanities and social sciences, privileging a global and transcultural perspective. The degree prepares graduate work in social and cultural institutions, both public and private, in agency and association active in sector culture, mediation, hospitality, law and public health, culture relations, social psychology, humanitarian organization and non-profit association. One, uh, another example is the uh, bachelor degree course, communication and interpreting in Italian sign language that aims to train interpreters of a sign language, offering a general knowledge of linguistics, semiotics and philosophy of language, as well as a general knowledge of disability legislation psychological and anthropological aspects, specific education needs of the deaf community, competencies in the theory and techniques of translation with reference to European languages. Another example of interdisciplinary is the degree course in philosophy and artifici uh, artificial intelligence that aims to provide a philosophical training 
in order to deepen the fundamental or artificial intelligence, its application and social and ethical consequences. Then we have the bachelor degree uh, course in geographical sciences for environment and health. That also is an example of interdisciplinary courses uh, that train professionals capable of reading, interpreting, and representing the territory in different geographical scale with particular attention to current aspects and problems or great social interest as environment, economic, historical, and social, sanitary, epidemiological phenomena migration and mobility, natural hazard, tourism, um, development, and sustainability also. As far as the language course are concerned, of course, since I'm a teacher of Japanese language, uh, I will also mention the course in Oriental Language and Civilization. And uh, one of the aims of this course is to broaden job opportunity by creating the right connection between university and several kinds of work field, not just literature or history. Since 1990, the faculty has an agreement with Tohoku University, thanks to Professor Ozaki, who worked very hard since the very beginning, and also thanks to the opportunity Sapiens had 15 years ago to be here to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the Tohoku University. Through the Italian Institute of Oriental Study, we had a fruitful exchange student program with the University, and um, we uh, wish to keep running this agreement. One of the values proposed by, by the Asecura League is the interdisciplinary research in cooperation with the fields of science, technology, engineer, arts, and mathematics. Four years ago, the Italian Institute of Oriental Studies organized several seminars on this topic with the title Mirai Shorai, using the two Japanese words to signify the idea of future. One of the seminars in collaboration with Tohoku University included a talk between Professor Tadokoro <laughs> Satoshi of the Department of Application for Information Science and Professor Nardi of the Department of Computer Control and Management Engineer of Sapienza. It was a very significant occasion for our students and for us teachers too, to create the opportunity for mutual discussion on specific themes related to the idea of future and to reflect on the more practical and empirical side of all the issues involved in the idea of future, as well as to stimulate a reflection on how to promote interdisciplinary research. The other talks discuss the future in architecture with Professor Yumi Kori, sociology with Professor Tsuchiya from Waseda University, literature with Doi Professor, Professor Doi uh, from Tokyo University, and art with uh, Professor Kojima of Waseda University. As a teacher of Japanese language and literature, the collaboration for artifi with artificial intelligence or with the CAT tools engineered for translation, for instance, are very stimulating. But these are just some examples of the several interactions we can think of to shape interdisciplinary and integrated approaches in cooperation with the STEAM field. Hoping that our universities will always be a model of tolerant, respect, solidarity, peace building, sustainability. Once again, I would like to extend a heartfelt thank you to Talk University for the warm welcome and to all of you for your kind attention. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for the significant speech, Professor Mastrangelo. So next, I would like to ask the sixth speaker, Professor Albert Do Young, Academic Director of the Leiden Institute of Area Studies, Leiden University, the Netherlands, to give his speech. So please start. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Ono, um, uh, distinguished guests, dear colleagues, dear students, it's a great honor for me to be here and an even greater honor 
to have been invited to say something about the future of the humanities and the social science from the perspective of someone who is both a colleague in these fields and a person taking up a role of leadership, however modest that role truly is compared to the people sitting here behind the table. I will be remiss if I did not convey to Tohoku University as a community and to its Graduate School in Arts and Letters the sincerest congratulations and best wishes from the Dean of the Faculty of Humanities of Leiden University, Professor Mark Rutgers, and the Rector of Leiden University, Professor Hester Bell. Leiden is proud to have found in Tohoku University a true partner for scholarship. There are numerous ties that bind us. We have sent our students and colleagues to visit you, and we have welcomed your students and your colleagues, including Professor Ono himself, to Leiden. As we celebrate today and tomorrow many years of achievement, I look forward to maintaining our strong bonds of friendship and exchange. Now, I was asked to show you a video about my university, and here you have another example of old people trying to figure out technology. Um, uh, thank you. Discover the world at Leiden University. Founded in February 1575, Leiden University is the oldest in the Netherlands and was the first to practice freedom of belief and religion. The university has campuses in both Leiden and The Hague and consists of seven main faculties. Archaeology, Humanities, Law, Medicine, or the LUMC, Science, Social and Behavioral Sciences, Faculty of Governance and Global Affairs. For highly talented students, Leiden University offers a number of extracurricular programs. For bachelor students, we have Leiden University College The Hague. The university faculties and other buildings are scattered throughout both Leiden and The Hague and include a number of beautiful historic buildings as well as modern custom design facilities. The students who live and study at Leiden University give these cities a relaxed yet vibrant atmosphere. Leiden University has about 27,000 students with about 17,000 bachelor students and about 10,000 masters or professional students. These students include over 110 different nationalities, making Leiden University a true melting pot of culture, language and beliefs. Leiden University has about 50 bachelor programs, of which 10% are taught in English, and about 80 master programs, with 250 specialisations, of which almost 100% are taught in English. Leiden University is one of the top Dutch universities in the international ranking tables, such as the Times Higher Education and the ARWU. Leiden University has over 100,000 alumni, which include such illustrious names as our Prime Minister, Mark Rutte, and other Dutch and foreign politicians and leaders, King Willem Alexander of the Netherlands, and his mother, Princess Beatrix. Many of these famous names can be seen in what is known as the Sweat Room. This is a unique room inside the Academy building where students wait to hear their final results and then afterwards write their signatures on the wall. Leiden University has won the highest number of Spinoza Prizes between 1995 and 2016, which is the highest scientific prize in the Netherlands. To further strengthen this position, the top-level research is grouped into 11 interdisciplinary profile areas. Leiden University has a number of key partnerships. These include the Leiden Bioscience Park, which is the Netherlands' largest knowledge cluster in the field of life sciences and consists of over 90 specialist businesses. Leiden University is also a partner in Medical Delta, the South Holland Consortium of Knowledge Institutions, Business and Government in the field of the life sciences and medical technology. Leiden University has also joined forces with Delft University of Technology and Erasmus University to create multidisciplinary research centres and to offer a number of joint teaching programmes. To find out more about Leiden University, 
visit www.leiden.edu. Well, it's hard to compete with Rome and Naples and, and Krakow and, and, and Granada, and we don't even have mountains, uh, but Leiden is truly a delightful city. Um, um, so now is the time to talk to the next generation, that is to you. Uh, and I'm very happy to do so. I was very happy to see the real efforts made by Tohoku University to raise awareness and interest in the humanities and the social science, sciences among high school and uh, undergraduate students. So I'm going to greet and then ignore the august body of uh, colleagues with whom I'm privileged to share a stage and to talk only to those of you who are under 25. Now, traditionally, until perhaps the mid-20th century, there were two main reasons for the humanities to exist in Europe. You heard a little bit about this already from, um, from, um, from, from some of the colleagues. The first of these was to define culture for the nation state. That was the introspective side to the field, which thus became seriously implied from the start in the creation of nation states in Europe uh, and defining for them what the proper language should look like, what proper literature, art, and thought should look like. So that's one part. It's gone now, but it was one of the main reasons for the humanities to come into being. The other reason was to explain, and in many cases subdue, other cultures, right, or to glean from them what was relevant, and following a long-standing assumption that is common to many Protestant countries, what was considered important or relevant or true about any other society than the own was sought and was believed to be found in evidence that was very old. So if you want to know something about India, you don't have to go to India, you have to read the oldest Indian text that we have, and then you find the real India. So programs in what was then still called Oriental Studies taught students to read, not to speak Middle Eastern or Asian languages, and rarely encouraged students to go to the places they would write about because they were no longer the same place. Yeah? So the most famous, certainly the most productive Indologist the Netherlands ever produced, Jan Gonda, who wrote hundreds of books and, 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 and many hundreds of articles, on India, has never been to India in his entire life. He was afraid of flying. Yeah. So, so you see, and, and, and this was the argument, going to India is pointless because the India I write about no longer exists. So you see a small remnant of this in the study of the classics, in the study of classical Greek and classical Latin literature and ancient history, but otherwise it has fortunately died out. Yeah? There's just, and, and no one mourns that loss. We don't want to return to this at all. There is one legacy of it, and that legacy is precisely why I'm so happy to be here and to tell you something about the Leiden Institute of Area Studies or about what I think the development of the humanities should look like a little bit. And this legacy of that earlier sort of incarnation of the humanities has to do with the various disciplines within the humanities field, right? Linguistics, history, art history, comparative literature, the academic study of religion, philosophy, and so on and so forth. But to a large extent, the assumptions on which the fields or disciplines are based are still massively dominated by Western and more particularly by European assumptions or intuitions about human culture. I think there are two fields by now that have managed to distance themselves on these routes. If I, I can't survey everything, but I can try at least. I think on the one hand, linguistics has gone very far in sort of distancing itself from these roots, and on the other hand, the study of religion. And for linguistics, this seems to be the case because of its sheer size and diversity. This is a huge field. And for the study of religion, which is much smaller, it seems to be uh, because it came into being as a revolt against theology. So it, it explicitly sort of distanced itself from this sort of identitarian aspect of the traditional humanities. But in many other fields, the very necessary process of rethinking categories and rethinking disciplines is still in its infancy. And you see this, and in principle, it's a good development. Yeah? So you see this with the rise of programs in world history, in world art, in world music, in comparative philosophy. Yeah? So this basically means that these fields are finally 
taking into account the overwhelming majority of the world's population and the overwhelming majority of the cultural production of humankind, but so far, as far as I can see, right, always as an extra, not as the main thing. So it's always you have history and then you have world history, and that is something else, yeah? And that is why you are so desperately needed. If we manage to pull this off, right, that is, if we can truly move towards a global or a decentered or whatever you want to call it, transcultural, I like it, humanities, we can win a world, and I mean that quite literally. Uh, and this is even more true for the social sciences, and that brings me to the subject I should probably discuss with you, which is sort of a new idea of area studies that we're trying out in our institute. Yeah, so I'm currently the director of the Leiden Institute of Area, Area Studies. As you see, a fantastic institute with a terrible name. Um, and not only does the name recall the failed attempts to create a discipline called Area Studies in America, in the US, which turned out to be a Cold War, know your enemy kind of activity and allowed itself to become a political toy, uh, but it also continually, to this very day, invites discussion over the selection of the areas in my institute. Yeah. So my colleagues work on the ancient Near East, um, uh, and they work on the Middle East and on Asia, India, or South Asia generally, Southeast Asia, especially Indonesia, uh, Japan, China, and Korea. My own little field, the academic study of religion, also ended up in the Lias, which again is a bit weird, but it works really well for me. Um, uh, but the other areas of the world, right, so Europe, the Americas, Africa, Oceania, they're not part of what we do. Um, and we, we're working together with colleagues in the rest of the faculty who work on these areas, but there's a bit, something a bit strange in having an institute of area studies that only works on the Middle East and Asia. Um, uh, and we work together, especially in very large undergraduate uh, and graduate programs in international studies. Once again, a fantastic program with a terrible name uh, and uh, international relations. Yeah, so the Institute for Area Studies came into being not very long ago. It came into being together with the Faculty of Humanities in Leiden in 2008 as part of a process of uniting three former faculties, theology, philosophy, and arts, and of consolidating and clustering the very many departments that had historically grown into meaningful units. And when it was set up, the Institute was subject to two different expectations. They were asked to do two different things. On the one hand, it had to preserve, it had to continue, and it had to consolidate what Leiden was always known for, which is the study of languages and cultures of the Near Middle East and of Asia on the foundations of a solid linguistic and philological competence and deep knowledge of a variety of large, uh, of deep knowledge of a large variety of cultures and countries supported by outstanding libraries and, uh, and very large museum collections. Yeah? So everything that had historically grown needed to be protected somehow. That was expectation number one. But the other expectation uh, uh, was to become relevant. To become relevant to others, to become relevant to the humanities and to the social sciences as a whole, and to become relevant to society. And this expectation implied both a clearer focus and a greater effort to highlight contemporary questions uh, and an expansion of the Institute beyond the traditional humanities. So we were on a course to invent a new kind of area studies. So the Institute went on a course of massive expansion in areas like anthropology, sociology, economics, po uh, politics, international relations. And that created a problem that everyone saw coming which is the confrontation within departments between colleagues with radically different disciplinary backgrounds uh, and with radically different interpretations of the value of the more traditional fields. Yeah? It's not always easy to explain to a specialist in the political economy of East Asia why we would need someone to teach classical Tibetan. Yeah, so, so, so these problems were, were, were uh, they were, let's say, you could see this as an enrichment or you can see it as a threat, and both happened. I mean, some people saw it as, a, as an enrichment, others saw it as a threat. But the other thing that happened was that many students came, many more than we had before, and that many of these students wanted to work specifically on those fields that cut across social sciences and humanities approaches. And these students include a substantial number of so-called heritage students, 
right? So Dutch students whose parents or grandparents moved to the Netherlands uh, um, 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 and, uh, and who are curious about sort of part of their heritage. They also include a substantial number of students from the Middle East and from Asia themselves who are attracted, again, if I understand everything correctly, both by the traditional reputation of Leiden as a place where you can study deep history and culture and by the course offerings that focus on contemporary subjects. So we're lucky, we're lucky to teach both Sumerian, right, the world's oldest attested language that died out thousands of years ago, and business Japanese or internet Chinese. We have experts on Sung painting and on nuclear development in North and South Korea. We have world leading experts in fields as far apart as Chinese avant-garde poetry, Arabic papyrology, temples in late Roman Egypt, Japanese food and food packaging, Hindu iconography on the island of Java and the economy of Vietnam. And I could go on like that for a long time. Yeah, but you may wonder, and this is where it becomes a bit <laughs> difficult, and I couldn't fit it all on, 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 on a single slide, what binds us together. And I think there are two things that bind us together. So there are many things that keep us apart. There are two things that manage to unite. The first is a shared commitment to this new idea about area studies. So it's a reinvention of area studies as, and now I quote from a famous document called Where is Here, uh, we see area studies as an approach to knowledge that starts from the study of places in the human world from antiquity to the present through the relevant source languages with central regard for issues of positionality. Area studies is a dynamic synthesis of area expertise and disciplines in the humanities and social sciences, relying on sensitivity to and critical reflection on the situatedness of scholarship and foregrounding the area studied as not just sources of data, but also sources of theory and method that challenge disciplinary claims to universality. It should be inherently interdisciplinary by testing the boundaries of the disciplines and actively but carefully comparative by treating the why, how, and what of comparison as anything but self-evident. This vision draws on both tradition and innovation in scholarship. It is informed by the history of the field and its ongoing development in a post-colonial, multipolar, globalizing world. Yeah, so that's one thing I think that most of the people who work in my institute would still subscribe to, even though we believe it's in, it is in need of an update to make somewhat clearer that it is a real sort of conversation going on between various parts of the world. And the second thing that keeps us together is very simple, it is you. Yeah? Every year brings us new students, and lots of them, with new questions, new passions, and new ambitions who force us to rethink everything. So that whole process of preserving what needs to be preserved while attempting a bit harder to be relevant not only brought us many more students from all over the world, but these students also were instrumental in the very process. So these are exciting times to step into this world. It is a world of global exchange, and although everyone complains about the huge investment needed to learn a new language or to learn to understand a different culture, all who have mastered those will agree that that investment is always worth it. So today and tomorrow are days of celebration. They are momentous for this university and its many global partners, and we're all very happy to be here. I very much hope, therefore, that we in Leiden will be able to receive some of this next generation of students. You are very welcome, and I hope and I'm confident that we will continue to send our students to this amazing city and this amazing university. Thank you very much for your patience. Okay, Professor De Jong, thank you so much for the insightful speech, especially dedicated to young students. Thank you. So as the seventh speaker, we would like to have Professor Francis Tick, Director of the Institute of Intercultural Studies at Jagiellonian University. Poland. So could you start, Professor Czech? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. President, esteemed professors, dear students, dear guests, I'm very happy to join the celebration of Hasekura League values and I'm very happy to be together with you. Thank you very much for the invitation. Please 
Let me start in a way which is perhaps not academic in a way. Uh, but since a single picture is worth of thousand words, then the presentation where you can find the most important facts about the university is probably worth much more. this presentation which allow us to gain the most uh, basic information about Jagiellonia University. As it was said, uh, it is the oldest university in Poland, in the Central Europe. However, I represent the, one of the youngest faculty at the university. It is the Faculty of International and Political Science. And it was established just at the beginning, at the very beginning of the 21st century. If you know a little bit Polish history, you would be uh, aware that it was the best time for setting up such a uh, faculty because it was quite hard to talk freely about politics in Poland before 1989 and it was even harder to travel and study uh, foreign languages, foreign cultures, because no one had a passport in, at his home. So it was huge change for us, and we start to move a new direction after 1989. So more or less, our faculty is as old as Hasek uh, mm. In our faculty, we do have various area studies uh, institutes where you can find Asian studies, American studies, European studies, Russian studies, and Ukrainian studies as separated departments. And uh, there are also two problem-related institutes. One is political science department, which is the biggest one at the universe, at the faculty. The other one is the Institute of Intercultural Studies, which I am proud uh, serving, proudly serving as a director of the small, teeny Institute of Intercultural Studies. Mm, my institute is very um, interdisciplinary. We have sociologists, as myself, uh, historians, psychologists, uh, anthropologists working together and um, trying to study from different perspectives 
uh, such a topics as globalization, uh, mm, international migration processes, uh, transnational history, world art, uh, minorities around the world. So we very to much extent cooperate with different area studies department from our faculty. But I must say that although sometimes it's challenging, this is very um, um, provoked folk uh, provi provoking, uh, thought provoking uh, thing to study and to work in such interdisciplinary department. When you have still to struggle to understand the same phenomena from different perspectives and try to understand how uh, your colleagues from uh, other disciplines understand the same uh, problems. Uh, and I would not change my department for, for any other because of that uh, reason. Mm. I would like to talk a little bit about Japanese studies at the Akilonian University because I think it might be interesting for you. And there are actually three different possibilities to study Japanese culture at my university. First of all, there is a oriental program at the uh, philological faculty, which focuses mainly on language and uh, literary culture. Then at my faculty in the Asian studies department, we have uh, area studies on Japan and spe specialization on uh, Japan. And it is mostly uh, focusing on uh, culture, contemporary culture and society and politics of Japan. And then we have not the whole Japanese program, but Japanese track within the cross-cultural studies at our uh, department, which focus more on Japan in the international context. Uh, let's um, think about Japan in the same way as uh, Hasekura League try uh, to do it. But not as isolated island, but a place which has connect connections to many different places, cultures in the world. Just one example of um, mm, discussion with our student, I remember very well, a couple of years ago, uh, there was a question, why music of Polish musician Chopin is popular in Japan? We have many different explanations for that. The first one which came to mind is very tempting for some people, but at the end of the day, it might be very uh, misleading, is that there is perhaps some specific cultural link between Japan and Poland, which make Japanese people understanding uh, music of Chopin very well and its popularity from the late 19th century. But there might be, there might be other explanations as um, most of the uh, um, music of Chopin were uh, written for single piano. And it was much easier in the late 19th century to bring to Japan single piano than the whole orchestra. And because of that, it might be a, one of the reasons why particularly his music became uh, popular. But as we try to learn in our uh, faculty, there is never a simple answer. There is a lot of factors we have to take into account when we want to answer uh, to find a uh, final answer. Uh, I think the way of understanding Japanese culture, which we propose in our department, is not only similar to Hasekura League ideas, but it is also very um, crucial uh, way 
to understand really what is really going on and is, can be very valuable for all students. Why? Oh, I would explain it in this way. Mm. It was already said before that internationalization of uh, academics uh, and scholarship man, is very important for development because we can learn different culture. We can learn something new about distant, remote uh, cultures. But we should also remember that this is also a way for us to learn more about ourselves. Let me give a short example. When I came to Japan, I could start, or some young people who is the first time, for the first time in Japan, could start to think, to consider why Japanese people eat this way, eat with sticks, not with fork and knife. But then the second question is that he start to think why I do in my country do it this way? Why I behave in other way? So it may be a way to start to asking the question about things which are usually not visible for us, they are normal and we don't focus on them. And when we go outside of our culture, when we study uh, the other culture, then this is not only, as I said, um, um, tool to, to learn more about other countries, but also about your own. And I think this is important here when we talk about the when we meet on the Hasekura summit, but it's also very important for my uh, department. Please let me um, finish at the same way I started, since I know that sometimes words are not enough to uh, to fill the uh, um, atmosphere of a special place. I hope that short uh, video would help you somehow imagine uh, Krakow and the Jagiellonian University. Two and a half minutes. Three minutes.
was time for you not only to watch the pictures, but also to reflect a little bit on the thoughts before. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much for the thoughtful statement, Professor Czech. And lastly, we are pleased to introduce the eighth speech given by Professor Simon Suarez Cuadros, Vice Dean for Internationalization and Mobility, Faculty of Arts and Humanities of the University of Granada, Spain. So please start, Professor Cuadros. Mr. President of Tohoku University, Mr. Vice President, Distinguished colleague, dear students, Mina Sama Konishiwa, Sanin Nagara, Nihongo Hanasu Koto, Gadika. Unfortunately, I cannot speak Japanese, so I try to talk in English after this. It is a real honor for me to represent the Faculty of Arts and Humanities of the University of Granada here. First of all, I would like to express my most sincere gratitude to the organizers of the Hasekura Summit for the invitation and for giving me the opportunity to get to know this Greek country, the city of Sendai, and Tohoku University, an experience that I will carry close to my heart and I will never forget. I would like to congratulate, to congratulate Tohoku University on its uh, 115th anniversary and the Faculty of Arts and Humanities of Tohoku University on its centenary. It is a very important fact that you can celebrate this number, training and students are building the future of your country. My speech today is divided into three different parts. First, I will make a brief introduction to the University of Granada, the university I'm representing here today. In the second part, we will watch a video of our faculty, the Faculty of Arts and Humanities, and finally, I will briefly comment on the study of arts and humanities at a global level. The University of Granada is one of the oldest universities in Spain. It was founded in 1526 by order Emperor Charles V and ratified by a papal bull in 1531. So very soon, in nine years, uh, we will celebrate the fifth centenary of our university. The University of Granada is considered to have continued the tradition of the Madraza, an academic institution founded in Muslim Granada in 1349. The University of Granada is a university located in the south of Europe, and it's only one of the camp uh, is the only that has campus in two different continents, Europe and Africa. The University of Granada is divided into seven different campuses, five in the city of Granada, one in Ceuta, and one in Melilla, two cities located in North Africa, as you can see in the map. The city of Granada is one of the most famous and visited Spanish cities. It has a rich nature, a great history, and a magnificent legacy in the form of wonderful monuments. The University of Granada is a university open to the world, with exchange program for professors and students from all continents. Every year, students from 150 different countries come to our university, including students from Tohoku University. It is currently the leader in Europe in terms of mobility of the Erasmus program, a well-known and important program among European students. The University of Granada has about 55,000 students, of which 8% uh, of undergraduates and 24% of postgraduate are international. It has 27 faculties, 124 departments, 18 research group institutes, five research centers, and 532 different research groups. If we talk about the educational program, the University of Granada has 19 bachelor's pro degrees, 112 master programs, 28 doctoral programs, an extensive offer of expert certificate, summer, and online courses. Regarding master program, there are 19 in experimental science, 20 in arts and humanities, 
14 in engineering and architecture, 36 in social science and law, and 23 in health science. On the other hand, if we talk about doctoral programs, there are 10 in science, technology and engineering, 12 in humanities, social science and law, and six programs in health sciences. One of the fundamental pillars of the University of Granada is internationalization. Currently, more than 1,000 bilateral or multilateral agreements have been signed with more than 800 institutions from all over the world. More than 20% uh, of the students at the University of Granada are graduated with a notable international experience. Also, the University of Granada is involved in more than 50 international cooperation projects. The last great novelty of the University of Granada is that it coordinates the European Alliance ARCUS, an alliance that arises from the idea of creating a great, a great European university with campus in several cities. In this slide, you can see the partner of the university and the lines of the action of each, of each of them. The, uh, the university, that's four parts of the Arcos Alliance, are University of Lyon in France, University of Padua in Italy, University of Graz in Austria, in Austria, University of Leipzig in Germany, University of Vilnius in Lithuania, and since this year, University of Wroclaw in Poland and the University of Minho in Portugal. The University of Granada is also a member of the Coimbra Group of, of Universities, which brings together 41 European universities with great uh, prestige, including universities present here today, such as Leiden University, the University of Heidelberg, and the Jagiellonian University in Krakow. Here, we can also see other international groups where the University of Granada participates. Also, the University of Granada is a member of 142 international projects. And uh, also, the University is committed to global justice and has participated directly in 109 international cooperation projects, mainly in Africa and Latin America. The University of Granada is one of the 300 best universities in the world, according to the uh, academic ranking of the World University, being the second in Spanish and the first Andalusian, following these parameters. And some of the areas that can be studied at the World University being especially noteworthy. The University of Granada is perfectly integrated into the city. Its faculty and campus are distributed, uh, are distributed uh, all over the city, which gives to Granada a strong student character almost 55,000 students in a city of 240,000 inhabitants. The university generates this 6.12% uh, of Granada GDP. Also, the university offers many facilities and services for students and staff, such as accommodation, libraries, teaching resources, canteens, ped pedagogical advice, accessibility service, Wi-Fi connectivity, sport, and much more. We also have an international welcome center to help professors and researchers visiting our university. And now that I have me made a brief presentation of, of our university, I would like to show you a video presenting our faculty, the Faculty of Arts and Humanities of the University of Granada. The video is presented by, by our dean, Professor Ana Gallego Cuñas, who should be have who should have me here today, but uh, due to family circumstances, she was unfortunately not, not able to participate. But she did tell me to send a word of greeting for you. La Facultad de Filosofía y Letras de la Universidad de Granada es uno de los centros de humanidades de referencia en Andalucía, en España y en Europa.
contamos con tres dobles títulos, con 14 grados. Las historias, historia del arte, historia, historia de ciencias de la música, filosofía... También tenemos el bloque eh, de los grados que están dedicados a las ciencias sociales y a las humanidades experimentales, arqueología, antropología y geografía. Y después las titulaciones que se enfocan en el estudio de las lenguas, en la enseñanza de idiomas. Tenemos 18 lenguas en nuestro centro y también en los estudios literarios. Eh, aquí contamos con el grado en estudios ingleses, en estudios franceses, en estudios árabes, estudios clásicos, lenguas modernas, con especial énfasis en las lenguas eslavas y asiáticas, el chino y el japonés, las literaturas comparadas y la filología hispánica. Somos la facultad de Europa que más Eramus recibe, más de 500 cada año. Tenemos más de 400 convenios internacionales. Formamos parte de la Alianza Arcus como toda la Universidad de Granada. Y además nos preocupa la internacionalización desde dentro. Dedicamos actividades eh, para el intercambio lingüístico como el Café Babel y también para el intercambio de experiencias en el extranjero eh, como la Feria Erasmus. En tercer lugar, también es muy importante el potencial de nuestra actividad investigadora. Tenemos más de un centenar de proyectos y de grupos de investigación, eh, con líneas que son líderes en sus ámbitos de conocimiento. También desarrollamos líneas de estudio que son vanguardistas, radicalmente actuales, como la de los estudios de género, eh, los estudios latinoamericanos, decoloniales y las culturas del sur, las humanidades digitales, la relación de la ciencia humana con la inteligencia artificial y el Big Data. En cuarto lugar, eh, también es eh, muy significativa la amplia eh, variedad de oferta de servicios que da nuestro centro. Tenemos una biblioteca con más de 300.000 documentos, con zonas de trabajo comunes, zonas de estudio, zonas de descanso y una de las mejores hemerotecas de España. Y tenemos un plan robusto dedicado a la inclusión. Otro dedicado a la igualdad, con un punto violeta y punto arcoíris. Dedicado al bienestar y la salud, porque nos preocupa eh, cuidar de nuestro centro. También uno sobre formación, innovación y sobre profesionalización de nuestros estudiantes. Hacemos unas jornadas eh, de acogida, una jornada de bienvenida para los estudiantes de nuevo ingreso, unas jornadas de convivencia. Por último, también es importante para la Facultad de Filosofía y Letras el desarrollo de actividades culturales, que nuestro estudiantado tenga la oportunidad de conocer a figuras e intelectuales de relevancia mundial y que puedan asistir a debates, discusiones y mesas redondas sobre los temas y los problemas de nuestra sociedad, del pasado y del presente. Y por último, también es extraordinario el enclave de la Facultad de Filosofía y Letras de la Universidad de Granada. Estamos situados en el campus de Cartuja, en un edificio protegido, eh, con amplios espacios y con unas vistas privilegiadas al monasterio de la Cartuja y a la ciudad de Granada. Son nuestro futuro. Filosofía y letras es tu futuro. I would like to emphasize something about the studies of Japanese language and culture in the Faculty of Arts and Humanities. 
Currently, young people in Spain love Japanese culture, and for this reason, many of them choose to, to study Japanese, being one of the most popular and requested languages in our university. And much of this success we owe to Professor Nobu Ignacio Lopez Saco, here present, who was in charge of introducing Japanese in our university and is currently the coordinator of the Master of East, East Asian. So, thank you very much, Professor Lopez Saco, for your incredible work. Some years ago, when the course of Japanese language, literature, and culture were just starting, we received the kind visit of a, de a delegation from Tohoku University, led by Professor Akinori Tokahashi, and were invited to become a member of the prestigious Hasekura League, the fruits of which we are seeing today. We are proud and honored to be part of this group of university dedicated to Japanese studies with the lead of Tohoku University. Finally, to, to finish my speech, I would like to share with all of you some thoughts about humanities studies. We are facing difficult times for the humanities studies in today's world. There is a global crisis through, throughout the world. The idea the, that the humanities and arts are not profitable from the economic point of view is depending on, in all countries. Current education is valued under the principle of economic profitability forgetting essential values such as a, uh, free thinking, something that is fundamental for the people who study humanities. The changes that are taking place in the educational system are not being well valued. The humanities and arts are being eliminated from the educational system at the primary, secondary, and also in the university levels. These studies are seen as decoration that are use useless, ignoring the importance that they have for the formation of the people and society the, themselves. Even humanistic aspects of, of science and social science are losing, uh, are losing importance. See, most of the nation prefer to go for short-term benefits, cultivating skills that are useful and applicable with immediate, immediate effects adapted mainly for profit. If we look at most of the studies that are following each country, they are based on economic productivity, and that's why they are committed to, benef uh, to benefiting engineering, science, and technology studies. I think this is a short-term uh, way of thinking with the idea to obtain a more or less immediate economic benefit. Unfortunately, those who carry out this study ignoring arts and humanities. My opinion is that the sole concession of education is wrong. Obviously, we must not neglect the effect of education on the, of the economy or our country or our regional area. I have mentioned in the first part of my, my speech the importance of my university in the province of Granada. But I think that we must also pay attention to what has contributed and can contribute our humanities to our society, especially if we are talking about, or, uh, about one where democratic values prevail. From my point of view, there are three fundamental values for a democratic society. The society needs citizens who can think for themselves, where uh, they can reason with another person, offering well constructed arguments and accepting the views of others. The first of them is that the critical thinking is very important to build a diverse and a tolerant society with the rest of political opinion, religious beliefs, or any difference. The young people of the future, many of whom are sitting here today, must know how to value the benefits of being educated in humanities. In this way, you will learn to be non-conformist, to reject simplistic ideals with, a, uh, with free thinking, with a free thinking that will help you to be independent from the ideological point of view. You will also be tolerant of others. You will accept other points of view and they support by solid uh, arguments. The second point, that I would like to highlight is the ability of an individual to see themselves as a member of a community or a nation in a heterogeneous world. This is why understanding that there are different religions, languages, and diverse cultures, and tolerating all this difference is something that must be inculcated from a very early age in all citizens. And in this way, we will form society that are rich in respect and tolerance. At this point, I would like to address all those students who have chosen to study a foreign language. I always say at my university that you are very brave. 
the fact of, wa of wanting to know a new language, a new language, or a new culture, entails all this value, tolerance, respect, that any society in our world should have. On the other hand, history studies should be basic for any democratic society. This day, we see how political leaders manipulated history to justify the prolabra events, and therefore, it should be known. At the same time, that it should, uh, it should also serve us to understand and respect the tradition that have led the different, peop the different peoples to what they are today. Finally, the third point that I would like to stress is the importance or the force of forcing creative aspects in a student so they can develop literature, music, painting, and other artistic facets. They are the cultural sphere that survives generation. We enjoy, admire, and admire words that were made centuries ago and then continue to visit it and enjoy today. That is also humanities. For this reason, and to end my speech, I would like to address the student here today to express my deepest admiration for, uh, for having chosen to study humanities. And above all, may you never forget the importance of the humanities studies in preserving a modern democratic society. Aratamate omedetou gozamayas. Thank you very much. Domo arigato. Again, thank you so much uh, for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you so much for the significant presentation, Professor Quadros, that was very gracious with us, the humanities of the Hoku University. Thank you. So now we have listened to all eight professors from the representative member universities of the Hasekura League. So now let us move on to the background of the Hasekura League and its objective as an educational system of the intercultural and interdisciplinary social sciences and humanities. So Professor Koji Ono, another Ono, director of the International Graduate Program of Japanese Studies, or GPJS, of the Hoku University, will introduce more details about the program. So Professor Ono, please. Hello everyone, my name is Koji Ono, and the director of the International Graduate Program in Japanese Studies, GPJS. It is my job at this time is to explain why this commemorative event is called the Hasekura Summit. If I may, I would ask you all to look at pages seven and eight, the program book that you have at hand. In October 2015, Tohoku University hosted an international symposium entitled uh, How to Run Nippon Japan as an Object, Nippon Japan as a Method, at the University of Florence, Italy. The University of Florence was our general co-host for this event. 16 universities from nine countries, including Tohoku University, participated in this symposium, which presented 32 research papers in four categories. This launched the International Academic Network, Hasekura League, which was uh, home to promote faculty and student exchange as well as academic exchange among these participating universities. The name of this network, the Hasekura League, is derived from Tsunenaga Hasekura. A summary of the early modern Sendai domain, a man who is synonymous with enterprising spirits.
Tsunenaga Hasekura was a retainer of Date Masamune, the first lord of Sendai, who ruled the region 400 years ago. In 1613, despite the isolationist policy of the Edo shogunists, the Date lord dispatched Tsunenaga Hasekura as an envoy to Europe in hopes of cultural exchange with the rest of the world. After overcoming many difficulties, Hasekura was granted an audience with Pope Paul V in Rome in 1615. Our Hasekura League was named after this pioneering individual in the hope that together with research institutions around the world, we can build new interdisciplinary fields in the social science and humanities, learn from each other, engage in productive dialogue, and together nurture the minds of young people who can respond to the challenges of today. Indeed, there have been many inter-university agreements in the past. However, the traditional inter-university agreements were linear one-to-one -one or multi-university agreements with clearly defined and limited objectives, often confined to the unit with which they were concluded, and not always functioning effectively for the social sciences and the humanities and the demands for diverse knowledge and experience. As an example, I specialize in early modern Chinese history, understanding Hegel's work on the philosophy of history and Max Weber's social, uh, sociological studies are not only basic knowledge, but also teach me the importance of studying both Western and Eastern values in the study of history. In addition, when, uh, when I actually visited the historic city of Krakow in Poland, I stood face to face with the spread of the 13th century Mongol Empire, and at the same time felt its strong historical significance for the international strategy of modern China. In a similar way, at Leiden University, I saw the diary of Isaac Titin, a Dutch envoy sent to celebrate the 60th anniversary of the reign of Emperor Qianlong of the Qin Dynasty. I am currently working on the translation of this document, and I have learned that observing a country is not as easy as being the most knowledgeable insider and that the gaze of an outsider observer can really capture elements of a country's culture that have escaped notice. Through these experiences, I believe that the first step for the social sciences and humanities is to concentrate on knowledge in a variety of fields to encourage diverse experiences and to foster engagement in dialogue with many people. Therefore, the Hasekura League has taken as its purpose the creation and the maintenance of a spread uh, of a space of exchange based on a diverse network. The well-known phrase, Mencius mother, three moves, which comes from the story of Mencius mother who moved her address three times to choose the best environment for her child's education is often used to indicate the importance of the educational environment for young children. However, I think the same is true for high school students and graduate students and the researcher like us in the sense that changes in the environment have a profound impact on people creating new opportunities to find a place for one's research 
in a diverse array of academic environments is a central purpose of this Hasekura League. Since its formation, the number of participating universities has increased steadily, and it now includes 26 universities from 16 countries, including Tohoku University. However, the mere existence of a network alone is not enough to carry out actual exchange activities on a regular and effective basis. An organization is needed to manage uh, communication within, the, within that network and conduct regular activities. The GPJS at university is one mechanism that will play this role. Tohoku University has established 10 international joint graduate programs that go, uh, go beyond the framework of conventional educational systems and provide education in dedicated collaboration with leading overseas universities. The GPJS is the only social science and humanities program among the various programs, and it was established in April 2019. The GPJS aims to build a platform for Japanese studies as a new interdisciplinary field by broadly encouraging the study and education of graduate students and the mutual exchange of researchers, making full use of the characteristic and strengths of the social sciences and humanities at Tohoku University and the universities participating in the above mentioned Hasekura League. International symposium utilizing the Hasekura League are held annually, and the proceedings are published in collections of papers in English by uh, Mimesis, Mimesis International, a publisher in Milan, Italy. In addition, some program students have taken on the challenging task of obtaining a double doctoral degree from both Tohoku University and another overseas partner university. This Hasekura Summit, this Hasekura Summit held to commemorate the 115th anniversary of Tohoku University's founding and the 100th anniversary as a comprehensive university is designed as a forum to discuss new values in the social sciences and humanities and the future of academic and educational exchange from an international perspective. It also marks the opening of the second phase of the Hasekura League and the GPJS. And finally, I would like to introduce some photos of the activities of us so far. This slide showed the symposium as a Kahoskari University of Venice. And this next slide showed the workshop at Leiden University. And this is the University of Jagiellonian University in Poland. And the last slide, this slide shows the workshop in Hiraizumi. We have continued these activities online even during the COVID pandemic. I hope that these photos will excite even more interest among researchers and further researchers in the Hasekura League and the GPJS, and that it will serve as a call across the world to join us and jump into this project for the, fu for the future of Japanese studies. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you for the introduction, Professor Ono. 
So then for the remainder of the session, Professor Masahiro Yamaguchi, Vice President of Tohoku University, will speak about future directions in the global development of Tohoku University. So Professor Yamaguchi, please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much for the kind intro introduction. Um, first, may I say how pleased I am, I am to be a part of the Hasekura Sami, being successful, at least so far, <laughs> I should say. Um, in fact, I'm very impressed by all the presentation uh, t talking about achievement, progress, and of course, the future of the research and education in the humanities and the social sciences. In this presentation, I'll talk about the novel approach to the internationalization at Tohoku University, namely about the synergy between the international graduate programs and the international, international research collaboration in general, and the synergy between the international graduate program in Japanese studies and, and activities in the Hasekura League in particular. In that sense, my talk is a follow-up of the previous presentation by Professor Ono, and uh, I find some um, significant overlap. Anyway, I begin with this slide, which explains the basic concept of the international joint graduate programs in Tohoku University. They are graduate programs in strong collaboration with the leading overseas universities. As a natural consequence, we see the synergy between the education and research. In this case, graduate students are often to be your um, catalysis of the international collaboration so that the graduate programs accelerate the international collaboration, research collaboration and vice versa. In this scheme, students are jointly educated or supervised with our partner universities. They, therefore, they are requi required to study abroad in a, for a certain amount of time and some are awarded double degree or uh, certificates of joint supervision. Of course, we encourage the part uh, participation of students from the partner universities as well. And so the mobility among the students is not in the one direction, but in the mutual direction. We began with the program in the field of spintronics, which was established in the year 2015. We now have 10 such uh, programs, and about 300 stu graduate students are participating from Tohoku University side. And you see here that the Japanese, uh, uh, the program of the Japanese studies was established in the year 2019, which was already explained by uh, Professor Ono. Let me talk a little bit about uh, the program in the Japanese studies. While preparing this program a few years ago, I often talked with uh, two founders of the program, I would say, one is the Professor uh, Sato Hiro, and the other one is the Professor uh, Ozaki Haki, Akihiro. I can find him in the, in the audience. In fact, these two founders 
tried to persuade me to believe that how excellent this program, new program of the uh, Japanese studies could be. We have long and long discussion. And to make the long story short, eventually I was convinced or that I was persuaded that to believe that this is excellent. There are, in fact, several rationales to believe so. One is that Tokyo University has a legacy and tradition in the Japanese studies, perhaps going back to Abejio and other renowned researchers in the field. Second, this particular Japanese uh, program of the Japanese studies have a noble concept in addition to the Japanese studies as a uh, regional study, which is, uh, rather, I would say, rather conventional. And this particular um, program has a, Japan, uh, has a unique characteristic uh, of the Japanese studies as viewpoint and methodology, which bring a kind of new insight into the uh, Japanese studies. Related to this, this particular uh, Japanese studies is not only for the Japanese studies in a narrow sense, but rather it is, all, also, um, it is for all humanities and the social sciences. But the most important thing is nothing but the uh, relation with the Hasekula League the, and the existing and the prospective uh, collaboration, research, co research and educational collaboration based on the Hasekula League. So anyway, this argument eventually led us to establish the international graduate program in the Japanese studies in the year 2019. This slide shows how the synergy between the graduate program in Japanese studies and the Hasekura League is now creating a new type of Japanese studies. We are very proud of having such a beautiful scheme and would like to support this activity more in the future. So conclude. I'd like to celebrate the success of the Hasekura Summit being held at Tokyo University today. And I wish the further development and the bright future of the Hasekura League. Thank you very much for your attention. Hey. Thank you for the presentation, Professor Yamaguchi. I hope these professors' presentations inspired the audience in some way. Questions to them will be invited in the next session. So now we have a 15 minutes break, although it is delayed. So please come back at uh, 1647. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>
you so much for coming back again. So part three is especially dedicated to the younger generation. In particular, it is our great pleasure to share this summit with many high school students as well as students currently enrolled at our university who have an orientation toward the social sciences and humanities with perspectives informed by intercultural curiosity and awareness. And on the stage, the leaders of the member universities of the Hasekura League remain seated, and now deans and directors of the schools and the centers related to the social sciences and humanities of Tohoku University are joining as well to watch and react to the discussion by young students. So on the left side of President Ono is Professor Toshiaki Yanagihara, Dean of the Faculty Graduate School of Arts and Letters, Next to him, Professor Kazuhito Noguchi, Dean of the Faculty, Graduate School of Education. Professor Hidenori Tozawa, Dean of the Faculty, Graduate School of Law. Professor Naoki Odanaka, Dean of the Faculty, Graduate School of Economics. Professor Daiko Takahashi, Dean of the Graduate School of International Cultural Studies. A Professor Tatsuya Kawada, Dean of the Graduate School of Environmental Studies, and Professor Satoshi Chiba, Director of the Center for Northeast Asian Studies. So now we are going to have two brilliant doctoral candidates who have just returned from the uh, one-year exchange program of the GPJS, utilizing the network of the Hasekula League to introduce their invaluable study abroad experiences, good and bad. After that, I will open the floor for questions and comments about all the presentations, including those in the previous session by the professors of the Hasekula League. Now the first presenter is Ms. Yoko Kagami from the Department of Japanese Linguistics at the Graduate School of Arts and Letters. She went to Italy to study at the Department of Asian and North African Studies at Kafoskari University of Venice. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Yoko Kagami from Tohoku University. I'm very honored to have the opportunity to speak here today. The title of my presentation is Breaking Away from Native Speakerism. But other than this, I'd like to talk about my experience overall. Italy is a country that has a deep historical relationship with Japan, starting from Marco Polo the Keicho Embassy that was headed by Hasekura Tsunenaga and left from Sendai, and the Iwakura Mission have connected Italy and Japan. In 2016, 150 years after the signing of the treaty, a celebration of the diplomatic relations was held. I visited Venice, which is located in the northern part of Italy, to study at Kafoskari University of Venice. This university was founded in 1868, the Department of Asian and North African Studies offers a Japanese studies course. Many Italian students come from all over the country to study Japanese language and culture. The main reason I decided to go to this university was that I was very interested in the research of one of the professors. I also wanted to observe high-level Japanese language education at this university for my research. Furthermore, my personal interest in Italy was also a motivating factor, such as Italian food, classical music, opera, and the Italian language used in it. Here, I'd like to introduce my supervisor, Professor Mariotti, who researches Japanese language education at Kafoskari. She is former president of the Association of Japanese Language Teachers in Europe, and she received the commendation for, uh, from the foreign minister. These represent the great impact she has made, not only in Italy, but also in Japan and other European countries. She tries to remove the traditional hierarchical relationship in Japanese language education between native speakers who teach and non-native speakers who are taught. 
and she tries to make it possible for everyone to learn independently. In pursuit of this goal, she introduced the concept of no-level brick language education. Besides of this belief, she has been carrying out various language education projects and seminars. I will now introduce the activities I was involved in during my stay. I observed Japanese language classes of first-year students who were learning the basics, and classes of third-year students who were the most senior and advanced students. In the seminar, I was involved in a vir uh, virtual yugaku project in which students from Japan and Italy collaborated online and weekly progress reports with other students. And I conducted a survey for my research. And then I, I summarized the results of the survey and gave a presentation. In addition, I had the opportunity to give a lecture in a Japanese class and also attend academic conferences for language teachers. And I learned not only about Japanese language education, but also about Italian. I found many things in the classes. For instance, buongiorno tutti means good morning everyone, and last noun means everyone. The ending of the word is conjugated according to the gender of the people who compose everyone. However, since this is problematic from a gender neutral perspective, recently, in written language, nouns and adjectives that change their endings according to gender are not specified, but are instead written using symbols like, ah, oh, sorry, like this, I'm sorry. I like this. It is very interesting reflection of ongoing cultural changes. In this way, I was able to learn a variety of things during my stay. Now I'd like to mention what it has been like for me living in Venice. The main feature of Venice is obviously the city's breathtaking beauty. I took a water bus to the university and the view of the wide ocean and the majestic buildings standing above it delighted me every day. During the evenings and nights as well, the landscape was always romantic and beautiful. When I was troubled by something, Seeing the landscape relaxed me. I also had the opportunity to make friends and exchange cultures. I got many Italian friends who were studying Japanese. We studied together, cooked together, went to events together, and shared many things. I also met some Japanese friends. We all had different ages, backgrounds, and interests. And spending time with them reminded me that diversity can be due to many things, not just differences in nationality. There are also many Japanese teachers at Kaposkari. They are my senpai, that is seniors, and they arrived in Venice through various routes. It was very interesting to hear their stories. They also allowed me to witness language education from the teacher's perspective which gave me many valuable insights from my research. Additionally, I went to the Far East, from Far East Film Festival that screened Asian films. At the event, Japanese food was also sold. And in Venice, there is an authentic Japanese-style pub. We can drink sake while eating Japanese-style dishes, and this place is always very popular. In this way, I had the experience of looking back at Japan from Italy. It was also possible to observe serious social situations. At a water bus stop, there was an advertisement from the health center promoting, promoting COVID-19 vaccinations. At another stop, there were scrolled messages denouncing countermeasures against COVID. The carnival was held in February but since there were still many cases of infection, some people dressed up while wearing masks. For a period of time, people had to wear particular masks when using public transportation or uh, entering public facilities. Additionally, I also saw demonstrations against the war in Ukraine. 
this was not in Venice, but uh, in the in the picture, as uh, as we can see at the, in the picture, uh, many citizens gathered for an anti-war demonstration. I also saw many rainbow-colored flags praying for peace. My Lithuanian friend was deeply shocked by the situation in Ukraine, and he made anti-war posters and put them up in town. At a supermarket, a shopping cart was set up to receive grocery donations for Ukrainian people. And I'd also like to talk about the cultural shock I experienced. I was surprised that when we are invited to someone's home, we should earlier uh, we should, sorry, we should arrive later, later than the specified time. In fact, this is being considerate of the host, because if one arrives early, the host may not be ready yet. Additionally, many businesses take a lunch break, which is usually from half past 12 to 3 p.m. In the beginning, I didn't know that, so I panicked when I tried to buy something at a store in the afternoon and nothing was open. Although this is often mentioned, but people tend to be really close to each other. They greet with a hug, and close friends have a lot of physical contact. When I was studying Italian, I was surprised to see the words abbracciare to mean to hug, and the word baciare to mean to kiss, in my textbook. The fact that these words appear in a beginner level textbook reflects their importance in daily life in Italy. I think the language education is an interesting reflection of the culture where the language is spoken. All of these cultural shocks were big surprises for me at first. However, as I continued to live there, I got used to these customs and learned that there were reasons behind cultural customs. I believe that cultural shock is a step towards understanding a culture. Next, I'd like to talk about my own personal growth. First, I will talk about breaking away from native speakerism. Before, I used to have a strong complex about my English. I could not help but want to speak like a native speaker. I felt silly and embarrassed because I could not communicate fluently in English. However, my mindset changed drastically after my study abroad. Even though I am still not very confident in my English, I have become very aware that everyone has their own style of language. And language proficiency does not determine a person's abilities or rights. This shift in my thinking was motivated by three experiences. The Nobrick seminar I mentioned earlier really encouraged me. Professor Mariotti's policy of every person has the right and responsibility to talk, no matter our language level, may have been the solution to my complex. I also felt very comfortable talking with the other students in the seminar, where everyone respected each other. Additionally, observing Japanese classes and interacting with students was a major turning point for me. The level of the classes was very high and the students did very well. However, they were not very confident in their Japanese. They were discouraged by the gap between their own Japanese and that of native speakers. I wanted them to be more proud of their efforts and language skills but in truth, I suffered from the same issue. These students helped me realize that comparing oneself to native speakers make it difficult to recognize one's accomplishment and reduce one's motivation. I was impressed by, one, uh, by what one Japanese teacher told me. She had her students write an essay in class and she said, Recently, more and more students try to write accurately using translation software. Instead, it has become harder to see the student's originality. Her statement implies that students are increasingly expressing themselves in a standardized way. That is, by focusing on what someone else says is correct, we might be unable to develop our own style of language. 
Moreover, there are many things I don't know even about Japanese. I was often asked questions about Japanese from the students, and it is not always easy to answer them. Even native speakers are far from perfect. These experiences made me realize that it is pointless to, to lose confidence and originality by focusing too much on the uncertain and unattainable goal of being a native speaker. And learning Italian was also an important experience for me. In the case of English, many people in the world use it, so it seems normal to be able to speak it. So I felt embarrassed that I could not speak it. And I focused on the distance between my current level and an ideal level, ideal English speaking level. However, there are fewer Italian speakers than English speakers, so even if I speak a little Italian, people react by saying, Oh, you can speak Italian, bravo! And I can focus on what I know. This experience reminded me of the original pleasure of language learning. Of course, breaking away from native speakerism does not mean that I have stopped studying abroad, uh, stu I'm sorry, studying hard, studying language hard. Rather, by changing my mindset, I became more positive about learn learning language and was willing to work hard. This was an important moment of growth for me. The second moment of growth was realized, realizing, realizing the importance of helping each other. During my stay, I experienced many difficulties. The most difficult one was that I slipped on a bridge and broke my leg a month before returning to Japan. Aside from that, it was quite difficult to find a house in Venice, and one day I had a toothache and I could not sleep. And another day, my entire body became red and itchy and I could not sleep. Also, the shower broke suddenly and there was no hot water, so I had to wash my head with cold water on a cold winter day. What surprised me was how incredibly kind the people around me were. When I slept on the bridge, people I didn't know gathered and bought me medicine and a drink, called an ambulance and waited with me until the ambulance arrived. When I talked to my professor and friends about my problems, they helped me find appropriate hospital and store and took me there. When my shower break, one of my friends let me use her bathroom and even prepared dinner for me. I have lived my life thinking that I do not want to bother people. Whenever I had a problem, I tried to solve it alone. However, I realized that it is imp impossible not to bother people, especially in foreign countries. I began to think that we should ask for assistance when we need it. As for language education, I have learned how to communicate with language learners in order to make it simpler for them to speak. This perspective will be useful when I become involved in language education in the future. Thus, now I'd like to help others as a person and as a language educator by drawing on my own experience. Before summarizing, I'd like to thank the GPJS for its support. Before my departure, I was given the opportunity to brush up on my English skills through seminars and classes in English. Additionally, I was able to develop an interdisciplinary methodology. Furthermore, I participated in international symposiums and got to know the atmosphere of academia abroad. During my stay, I received generous financial support and also support for the administrative procedures to seek a double degree. In summary, I'd like to emphasize three points. First, I believe that my personal re realization of necessity of stopping native speakerism has larger implications beyond myself. The idea could encourage language learners and also it has the potential to connect people around the world by removing the boundaries between native and non-native speakers. 
I believe this could contribute to the GPJS's goal regarding global issues. I have also learned the importance of helping others and being helped. Finally, I'd like to encourage those who are interested in studying abroad to give it a try. The growth that I have talked about was very beneficial for my research and also for my life. I hope that many more people will study abroad and have beneficial experiences in the future. That's all for my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Kagami-san. So next, I invite Ms. Pei Yao Wu from the Graduate School of International Cultural Studies, who is originally from China and who went to Germany to explore religious studies at the Faculty of Philosophy of Heidelberg University. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Wu Pei Yao and I'm from the Graduate School of International Cultural Studies, Tohoku University. I am honored to have the opportunity to give a presentation here today about my experience as an exchange student in Heidelberg, Germany. I am from China and I came to Japan in 2017. I went to Heidelberg University in Germany for 10 months from 2021 to 2022. Title of my presentation is Considering Transculturality and Connecting with the World. I will talk about the theme as follows. Firstly, I will say a few words about the reasons for applying for the exchange program. Secondly, I will talk in detail about my experience in Germany. Thirdly, I will reflect on the new perspectives on culture that I have gained from the exchange experience. I will start with talking about the modern Japanese ideas as concepts crossing boundaries. As is well known, the Meiji Restoration was not only a political movement, but also brought many changes to the intellectual world, among which the translation terms of Western ideas or concepts has to some extent changed the content of Japanese indigenous traditions and shaped people's very understanding of them. Words like shakai, jiyu, tetsugaku were all established as translation terms around this time. This was also the case with the word shukyo, religion, which is the main theme of my research. In this context, during the period from 1865 to 1873, the translation terms for religion differed from shushi, shumong, Shinkyo Kyoho, Kyomong, to Shinto, Shodo, and Hokyo Laihai. The chaos concerning the translation of religion was not settled down until at least the 1880s, with plenty of intellectual characters participating in the debate on what should a proper religion be and how to position religion vis a vis the state. Founded in Meiji 6, 1873, and aiming at the enlightenment of people living in the archipelago, Melo Kuzashi, as you can see here, played a crucial role at an early stage in this debate. Buddhist intellectuals were also involved in it. Studies about the concept of religion and how it was constructed through the process of negotiation in modern Japan have been flourishing since around 1990s, especially in this century. We, with scholars from both the Anglophone world and Japan exploring this process from different perspectives, here are some very stimulating works published in English or in Japanese. However, what I want to pay attention to is that in the margins of religion, we have another concept, faith, which is shinko in Japanese. 
It is a concept fundamental for the establishment of religion as a modern discourse. However, there are few studies focusing on faith independently. My research interests center around the development of the discourse on faith. By examining the concept of faith, I also aim to clarify the meaning of Japanese Buddhism and the construction process of it. The GPJS program offers me a great chance to conduct my research from a new perspective, which is from vertical to horizontal type of research. Specifically speaking, the program advocates for the idea described as crossing disciplines and boundaries. I will take myself as an example. The program provides me with courses designed for incorporating results and methods of not only religious studies, but also intellectual history, sociology, archaeology, and other fields to de develop new research. It also made it possible for me to study abroad, receiving education over there, and disseminate, disseminating my research internationally. The graduate school course I applied for is Transcultural Studies course in Heidelberg University. I am attracted by one of the study focuses of transcultural studies named knowledge, belief, and religion. It is stated, as you can see here in the homepage, that this focus offers insight into the dynamic history, circulation, and practice of knowledge, belief, and religion. It highlights relations between and entanglements of political and ideological, social and cultural, linguistic and artistic aspects in and between Asia and Europe. In combination with a unique interest in social and institutional agents, the study focus offers new approaches to the exploration of fields such as religious movements and worldviews, the migration of ideas and concepts, for example, democracy enlightenment, the rise or decline of intellectual cosmopolitan elites or the institutionalization of knowledge in educational contexts. I really resonate with the idea that the relations and entanglements crossing boundaries of space, time, and culture are very important issues and need more exploration. Now I would like to move on to talking about my experience in Germany. To start with, uh, I would like to show you a map of Germany. Can you see where Heidelberg is? Um, it's very small. Heidelberg is situated on the river Neckar in southwest Germany. As you can tell from the photo, it is a very beautiful city. And I love it very much. Actually, uh, this is not my first time to Heidelberg. I have been there in May 2018 to attend a graduate student workshop. I made a presentation about my research as an MA student and received from very, some very stimulating and interesting suggestions. The professors and students from Heidelberg University were friendly and welcoming to me. I left Heidelberg reluctantly, hoping to return again. Then, luckily, in 2021, I finally had the chance to go there again through the exchange program between Tohoku University and Heidelberg University. The support I have received from the GPJS program before I embarked on my journey includes interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary educational program, improvement of language skills, increased opportunities to go abroad, and find financial support. In addition to exchange programs abro abroad, students participating in the GPJS program will have opportunities to join the international symposiums or workshops to interact with researchers from other countries and broaden their perspectives. In addition, RA expense expenses are covered as financial support uh, from the second year of master's course to the third year of doctoral course. Therefore, students will be able to conduct research without much financial pressure. To be honest, when I went to Heidelberg University last year, I found it pretty hard to follow the classes and communicate with other people at first. This is perhaps because 
classes in Germany mainly consist of presentations and discussions by students. I was not used to speaking up because I was unconfident about my English and afraid of making mistakes. However, I gradually learned that the most important thing was not about speaking English ac accurately, but about voicing my own opinions. I decided to overcome my self-doubt by starting to prepare presentations with my classmates and friends, asking for the advice in advance, and practice English through tandem and buddy program that is prepared in Heidelberg University. By the end of my exchange period, although my English was not perfect still, I did have the courage to use it to express my feelings and ideas. Here I would like to introduce an interesting episode of culture shock, my encounter with academic knocking. Academic knocking is the practice of knocking on desks or tables at the end of a university lecture or presentations. It is considered as an alternative to applauding. It seems still unclear why instead of clapping the hands, knocking on desks or tables became the main way of applauding in Germany. But I managed to find one of the explanations. According to uh, Friedhelm Goluck, um, a founder and ex-chairman of the Association for German Student History, knocking beca began in 18th century, at which time students would drum on their desk with wooden sticks to show dissatisfaction dissatisfaction with the professor's lecture. Although it is unclear what, when or why at a certain point, knocking became akin to a round of applause as it is today. I also had the opportunity to attend the renowned Christmas market and drink the delicious hot, delicious hot wine. Unfortunately, due to soaring coronavirus cases in Heidelberg, the Christmas the Christmas market was closed soon. Nevertheless, I was lucky enough to have the chance to experience the festival atmosphere and to appreciate the customs and traditions of Germany. Now I would like to talk about something heavier, my experiences related to what is happening in the world right now, as described as the, the globalization. During my stay in Germany, I went to the Berlin Wall, which was a guarded concrete barrier that divided Berlin from 1861 to 1889. I also visited the memorial to the murdered Jews of Europe, which was designed by architect Peter Eisenman and Buru Hapold. According to the project text, the city were designed to produce an uneasy, confusing atmosphere, and the whole sculpture aims to represent a supposedly ordered system that has lost touch with human reason. Visiting these places made me think more deeply about the trauma of war and conflicts in the human history. The Italian philosopher Benedetto Cloge once said, all history is contemporary history, which means that history is written from the point of view of contemporary preoccupations. Learning about modern history while actively participating in current political discussions, for example, the issue of Russian-Ukraine war helps me become more aware of my position and responsibility in the world as a whole. Next, I would like to move on to the last part of my presentation, the new perspectives I have gained on culture. I would like to go back to my research question and talk about what I have, what I have gained from the exchange experience. Firstly, I have learned that the formation of religion, as you can see here, is shukyo in Japanese, zongjiao in Chinese, and um, chongkyo, perhaps, in Korean. Um, I have learned that the formation of these terms should also be considered not only in Japan, but in the East Asian cultural sphere. 
In more concrete terms, it is a historical process that dates back to the second half of the 19th century and a phenomenon that has had a profound impact on contemporary ways of thinking. Secondly, I have also observed that there is also um, a heightened focus on the concept of faith in Germany. So how does my research fit into this larger framework? By pondering on this question, I realized the importance to link my research as well as Japanese studies with theory if we want to disseminate Japanese studies internationally. As a Chinese student traveling from China to Japan, the 10-month exchange program from Japan to Germany was a very valuable and meaningful cross-cultural experience for me. It deepened my awareness of the often forgotten aspect of the concept of culture, which is captured by the term transculturality. As globalization proceeds, we face various crises such as immigration, population, po poverty, and environmental problems. How should we understand and respond to these problems without being restricted by our prejudices? This, perspec this perspective is perhaps the most precious thing that exchange experience has brought me. At the end, I would like to say that studying abroad is not only about learning foreign languages and conducting research in other countries. By cultivating a global perspective, it is also possible to reflect on the transboundary nature of culture and to ponder on our own position in the world. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Usan. So now I open the floor to questions. As I mentioned, there are many students from high schools, including Yamagata East Senior High School, Sendai Ikue High School, Sendai Mukaiyama High School, Sendai Shirayuri Women's High School, and Sendai Seiryo High School, some of who have questions to ask. So I would like now to invite questions from high school students first, either in English or in Japanese, which will be interpreted simultaneously in either direction. So then I will move on to questions from others. The first questions will be from students from Yamagata East High School. Please go ahead to the mic, microphone. Hello, everyone. My name is Fuka Matsuoka. I think it is one of the attractions that Tohoku University has a strong connection with foreign countries. However, in the past few years, our activities are restricted because of the pandemic of COVID-19. So I would like to ask you what, what you are trying to be connected with other countries at Tohoku University in this difficult condition. Okay, thank you. In the light of the expertise of the professors who are here today, so the answer might be related with a solution in uh, social sciences and humanities. So I would like to ask any of the deans from Tohoku University to say few words to her, please. Yes, Professor Takahashi. Um, thank you for your question, uh, which I think is an um, important issue in this pandemic situation. Um, let me answer your question uh, by talking about what we, uh, the Graduate School of International Cultural Studies, have done or have experienced so far. Um, as you may um, imagine, um, uh, the pandemic um, has a serious effect on uh, international research. And our graduate school has many researchers um, who are interested in uh, what happens or what happened in a country or region outside Japan or uh, some other uh, professors are interested in 
uh, international issues or international phenomena. So the pandemic has seriously affected uh, their research activities. So that's an unfortunate part of the pandemic. Uh, at the same time, um, we as a graduate school of international cultural studies promote uh, international research collaboration. And you may think that um, you know, this too is, has been seriously affected by the pandemic. But the truth is, um, thanks to the pandemic, um, <laughs> Um, technology, some technology, uh, including uh, most notably uh, online meeting tools, uh, have become prevalent. So uh, we can use it, we could use it, and um, uh, actually uh, during the pandemic, um, we could build uh, more uh, international connections with our researchers in foreign countries. So uh, we decided to increase the number of uh, lectures or talks by, uh, interna uh, by international researchers living in foreign countries. Um, you know, they could, uh, I, we, asked, we asked them to give us lectures or talks online and uh, we could do it with less cost because uh, we didn't have to pay for their uh, air tickets or hotels. So, uh, we could um, uh, have more um, international, we could start new international research connections or uh, maintain or strengthen our existing international connections. So that's a positive part of the pandemic. So I hope this can answer your question. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. So then the next student's question Please. Hello, my name is Kota Kagami. Personally, I think that learning history accurately is one of the most difficult problem in the modern world. So I'd like to ask that, what do you think about the importance of history education for the future children? Uh, to understand our history as a whole and to preserve our historically invaluable heritages. Okay, thank you. So would any of historian professors answer to his questions? Tohoku University or Hasekurari? Yeah, please, Professor Hus. I happen to be historian, so <laughs> I guess... Um, you all know that Vladimir Putin thinks he is a historian. And last year he published an essay on the history of the Ukraine saying it has no history because it was always part of Russia. It is, I think, the duty of professional historians and the teaching to look at the danger of national histories that are serving for imperialistic or other causes. So you use the term preserving heritage. But as I think we had one of the students present, the question of old history is also contemporary history. We do, of course, have to rethink our interpretations about the past because of current development. I never thought there would be a war in Europe in my lifetime. I was wrong. So maybe I learned the wrong things from history, or maybe I was too naive or optimistic. In the same way, however, in 1989, I had not expected East and West Germany to have a wall falling and become united. So even if you're knowledgeable of history, we cannot always predict the future, but you may be aware of interpreting certain problems that may arise that give you a more nuanced understanding of historical possibilities. And one of the issues that I see coming up all across the world because of the pandemic, but also because of what we see elsewhere, is the rise of nationalism. And one of the developments in history from the 19th century is really the history for the nation state, or as my colleagues talked about, you know, humanities for the nation, 
um, versus the other cultures. And I think to be aware, to think of history beyond the nation will still be important, for example, for high school student instruction um, and for further learning. Thank you for answering. Okay, uh, thank you. So next questions may be by students from Sendai Ikue High School. So please go ahead. I'd like to speak in Japanese. So I am from Senda Ikue. My, my, my name is Kuma. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to ask a question to you. So my question as follows. By learning the uh, social science and humanities, what type of um, uh, students should I be? Or what uh, type of the uh, society that you are uh, aiming to be? Or do you have any dreams about uh, by, uh, educating uh, the human Humanities. So, how uh, would, you, uh, would you educate a young student to uh, what kind of adult <laughs> or something like that? So, any professors from Tohoku University or Hasekura League? Okay, Professor uh, Oda Naka, uh, <laughs> please uh, answer the question. Yes, uh, uh, I'm sorry to keep masks because of my uh, physical condition. And, but uh, uh, maybe uh, as you heard that the presentation of two of our students, uh, <coughs> his name is Kagami-san and uh, uh, U-san. Uh, I think that the, the experience taught them that it is very much important for them to, uh, uh, when they go to go, go abroad, uh, it, is, it is there uh, very much important to, uh, as a result, to know themselves at the end of it. For example, um, Kagami-san uh, went to uh, Italy, but after all, she knows that uh, what uh, she knows, I, I think, uh, to my opinion, she, uh, the result of her visit to uh, and stay in Italy was uh, knowing the common sense prevalent in Japan. And as for the case of uh, Usan, uh, af after uh, coming back to Japan, I think uh, the most important uh, knowledge uh, that she got was that the common sense which she got, she had got in China and maybe in Japan. So uh, for, for us too, uh, as, for, uh, the, uh, as for me uh, as a Dean of Economics Department, of course I would like to uh, have a student when they uh, graduate from our department to uh, got to have got uh, the knowledge about economics, but at the end of end, the final uh, objective of our education is to uh, bring up the young generations who knows that they are caught uh, by their common sense, and maybe they could bring down that common sense to create a new word. That is my personal opinion. Yoroshi desu ka? Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. So next student, you. please. So maybe she will be the last person from high school. え、高校から質問は彼女が最後になります。マサリカナと申します。仙台育英大学高校から来ております。え、高校から質問は彼女が最後になります。え、高校から質問は彼女が最後になります。え、高校から質問は彼女が最後になります。え、高校から質問は
interested in the field of social science and humanities. And I'm actually in the third year of high school and I'm in the middle of my applic university application process and I, I, writ I write out tons of personal statement. Current I'm currently writing a tons of personal statement and every essay requires me to answer why, what, why do you want to study, but also how you can contribute to the world by studying humanities or by pursuing my interest. And to be honest, I want to study humanities or social science because I'm just interested in and I haven't figured out what can I do by studying those subjects. So as I want to ask of the professors uh, who pursued, who already pursued the field of study that how, how to study in those fields can contribute to the society or is there any moment you feel that, oh, I, I contributed to the world by doing my own researches? Is, is, yes, is that my question? Okay, thank you. Any professors? Would you like to answer to her questions? <laughs> this difficult general <laughs> question. Ah, okay, Professor Tottori. You know, are making a fundamental question for <laughs> professionals in the humanities. It's like asking us if we think of ourselves as useful in contemporary society. And it's a good question, a very good question. Uh, what can I tell you? F from our point of view, we consider ourselves as useful as in our position and having had the possibility to come here and to talk to you and to visit colleagues and friends. In general terms, I think in Italy, in Europe, everywhere, we are really facing the divide between to study scientific, technical things m of more direct use or humanities and so on since in the past time the two lines broke away. In the past there used to be a more complete uh, humanistic uh, culture and people used to carry out uh, a, a learning in technical things and cultivating humanistic uh, uh, knowledge to ask themselves about men and future and so on. What I can say now about uh, this question I think we are in a time where crossing of experiences and learning are fundamental. We are facing a time where you have many uh, faculties around the world in technical and scientific things that put departments in the humanities because they perceive that to complete the formation of these people, something connected to ethica, ethics, uh, uh, knowledge of diversity is important. At, at the same time, in my and many other universities devoted only to humanities, uh, we are introducing scientific knowledge and so on. Uh, we are in a world where you cannot cultivate all the fields. You have to specialize, but in this field, uh, humanities and the specialization in humanities, uh, it's a key, as I said also in my intervention, where you come to appreciate and you come to know the diversity of the world and how what is supposedly truth in scientific and technological development must be translated to different cultures and to different people also cultivating the same culture. This is something that comes from study of history of present contemporary societies and can really give something more to a technical and scientific necessary knowledge. I think this is uh, the great uh, gift given by these studies, combined with other skills, and it's really uh, the future. Uh, I know from the experience of my country and also in some places in Europe, where uh, the possibility given by so many students we have are given by the skills of people in scientific and technical things that cannot cope with the diversity all around the world. And so they are pushed inside the economic system because what's coming from hard sciences, uh, uh, education, lack something. And on the other side, also people in humanities can lack something. We have to cross knowledge, specialize, and really consider that uh, training in uh, uh, humanities can be helpful 
to make of people citizens of the world, at least to know how to deal with the complexity of the world. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you so much for your active engagement. So now we may invite questions from any others. Uh, okay, please. First of all, thank you for your presentation and giving me an opportunity to ask questions. My name is Aki Sakai. I am a student majoring in Japanese, uh, Japanese history uh, at Graduate School of Art and Letters at Tokyo University. Um, for my research, I use some digitalized document from organization like the Japan Center for Asian Historical Records, and I am currently undergoing archivist training in my department. Um, considering my experience with archives, I would, I would like to ask the following question. In the presentation, President Ono talked about the plan to further promote the humanities by making use of these assets and international project. As a humanities student, I am looking forward to further developments of these projects. So if possible, could you explain in more detail about the aspect of these projects? Thank you. Okay, thank you. It is directed to President Ono. So do you have any answer to okay, that? Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, it's uh, resonate to the first question that, uh, that she asked. And, and uh, we, we put forward in 2020, July, a uh, connected university strategy, which uh, basically means that we use full uh, digital technology to connect us uh, everyone and, and our university to every corner of uh, the world. Um, and the uh, digital humanities or is part of this strategy and we would like to see all our assets uh, that we have, uh, documents and so on and so forth, uh, ancient ones as well, uh, digitized and archived so that we can share uh, those uh, precious uh, assets with uh, our colleagues a and also uh, want to develop uh, technology to decipher in a more accurate way you know, what is written and why is it written uh, on those uh, uh, ancient documents. Uh, that will tell us how useful the technology is, like AI and other things, and also, uh, I, I would uh, tend to believe that it will tell us uh, how limited the technology at the moment is. So uh, that's, uh, that's very beneficial to both uh, all you know, participating uh, uh, you know, scholars. So uh, I think it's one of the uh, wonderful uh, sort of future that uh, we can pursue together uh, of uh, digital archiving. And I believe there is one already on the drawing board uh, together with Sapienza uh, that we are planning to do uh, together on, uh, let's see, a study of social changes after World War II, if, if, that, uh, if I remember correctly. Could you uh, follow up on this, please? Uh, if I may just uh, um, say that in this occasion, it, I am very happy, President Ono, to hear about this project. And uh, yes, with Sapienza and Toko, we have already um, um, research about uh, history, and this project uh, can um, be developed through the digital archive. And this is a, a very important project. And as Professor Dion said, we are all, um, we have the mission, uh, in a way we are responsible to uh, protect the culture, or at least uh, to do our best to protect the culture for future generation and for us as scholars and the future scholars. So in this sense, 
I am very happy, President Ono, that um, the project will uh, keep on. And of course, as a teacher of Japanese literature, I think it will be very important to think about also the project um, to digitalize the uh, literature materials. Uh, this morning we saw all the treasure and all the collection about, for instance, Natsume Soseki. And uh, uh, it's very important to have this material and um, if we can, we can have this material here in Sendai, but also on the other part of the world and uh, uh, use the digital archive as a basis to do some uh, sharing project research. So I um, have to say, Mr. President, uh, that I have a very high expectancy about this project. And I really hope that this project will keep on also, including the, not also history, but also literature and other, other materials. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm looking for the development and also hopefully I can use this kind of digitalized archives in the future as a researcher. Okay. Thank you, uh, Professor Mastrangelo and Professor Ono. So any other questions? Uh, so maybe the one. Hello, my name is Yosuke Kumagai. I'm a, Gaiyama, I am, I'm a Sendai Mukayama student. I'd like to ask Professor Francisk. You said that watching the same thing from, from a different perspective is important. I want to learn education policy science from different perspectives in university. So what is the best way to learn, to learn academic from a different perspective? Let me hear what you think. Okay, would you answer to his question? Uh, thank you for your question. Um, I can answer in two ways, in a broader perspective, and, in, and I will start with the broader perspective. So, if I understand correctly, the question at the core is about the role of education and different perspectives on uh, how they shape the education, yes? So, this is also a little bit answer to the previous question on the role of the university, what we, what we want to achieve, yes? And if you look to the aims of uh, education in social sciences, you can see two different levels where you can gain something. The, the first level is your knowledge. The knowledge you, I don't know, you can count it somehow. For instance, how many books of, of plays of Shakespeare you know, how, how much do you know about the specific culture and so on. This is one layer of academic education, social science education. And the other one is um, kind of intellectual formation. And this process, it is hard to grasp. It is hard to see. Just after a couple of years, you're looking back and you see that you look to the world in different way. And um, when you start to look from different perspectives, you can become and our citizen, this intellectual formations taking place. What it means that through the taking different perspectives you are becoming uh, our citizen. It means that you uh, start to focus not only on the material values. Uh, Greeks were, uh, this is, words with spe specific connotations right now. Uh, anyway, Greeks were talks about some people, they were calling them barbarians. And those was, were those people who were focusing on, according to Greece, to Greeks, just on the material values, just about their business. And 
Every citizen is something completely different that you can recognize different problems, different ideas, and it is how it is what you can gain when you uh, looking when you try to understand different perspectives. When you go to other countries, when you try to think through the eyes of other people, yes, it is never completely possible, but this is kind of training, which I try to say, help us to uh, gain this intellectual formation. You cannot notice it, notice it very often, but it really takes place when you're trying to do this. I hope I answered your question this way. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We may have one more question, the last one. Uh, okay. Good evening. Uh, my name is Kia Kor. I'm from Tohoku University, and I have a more of a philosophical and existential question, I guess. Um, I am originally coming from Russia, so being someone uh, who started war with our neighbors and a uh, country which uh, is currently destroying lives of thousands of people, I was wondering, how do you continue being a scholar? How do you continue your research and try to, like, to preserve the culture, preserve uh, like um, the good relationships with everyone. If uh, currently this horrible situation is happening, you know, like uh, I was reading this uh, information about uh, Syrian mystics, and he was saying that if you're a scholar, your main purpose is to keep transmitting that light going for generations and be that mirror, and to keep yourself like pure so that light goes on to the future. But at the moment, with uh, things that are happening, you just feel very dirty. So I was wondering what, uh, if you could just, um, I don't know, give me some answers and advice. OK, thank you. Any professors? Okay. So uh, Professor Mastrangelo. I think that although the peer is very difficult for all of us and, and of course, for you, you uh, can have a very good chance to um, explain to other people your point of view on this, about the situation and also learn something more about your country. Because when we are abroad, we have the chance to learn, of course, a lot about the culture where we live and uh, what every day we see but also we had a good chance also to learn about uh, our country. And uh, uh, for me, coming from Italy was not so tragic, but of course they uh, used to ask me every day about spaghetti, about mafia. So the was not so uh, easy at all. And um, I had very beautiful and wonderful uh, teachers, of course, but every lesson they used to ask me uh, Italy what about Italy? And many times I just didn't know what and how to answer, and I had to study uh, Italian literature, Italian opera, in order to answer them. And at the beginning I said, well, I'm not here to learn uh, Italian culture, but um, I understood at the end that was my best occasion to understand my country uh, and to understand how to present our country to other people, and sometimes also to have the occasion to uh, present something that other people can never see about your country. So it's a not a, a happy uh, time now. It's very difficult, but I think that you can use this occasion in the best way. Okay, uh, maybe Professor Tech may have other words. <laughs> Thank you for that question. Um, first, of, uh, first of all, I would like to say that every country has some dark sides in history and uh, we have just to face it. And when I was mentioning this intellectual formation just a second ago, um, to form 
to, uh, it is also possible from bad experiences. It is also food for thoughts. Yes, so you can do something about uh, that when you try to think in the way as it was uh, earlier said by Professor Fools. But there is also one more step. Uh, when the war started, Krakow is just 250 kilometers from Ukraine, uh, even less. And um, of course it was a huge thing and we start to uh, different actions to help Ukrainian students and some Ukrainians coming uh, Poland. But the same weekend, my colleagues asked me, oh, we have a couple of students from Russia as well and from uh, Białoruś, so we should met th meet them and ask if everything is okay. And what's happened? The first answer was, yeah, it's everything is okay. We didn't uh, experience any bad uh, uh, reactions from from another students but we also learned that they were the first one who were involved in helping Ukrainians they were very much involved so uh, the thing is that of course we know it is not only Putin and he has some supporters in Russia but in each society you have various people uh, you have some people who try to help and I can I witnessed it at my university with Russian students. So just have to think what you can do about that and just start to act. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, I would, I'm sure that me and my friends and everyone would just like to do their best to support Ukrainian people and just find the best outcome of this. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So I'm afraid we are running out of time. I'm terribly sorry, but we must finish the session now. So maybe the conversations and the questions can, be, can continue less formally after the summit. So thank you so much for the fruitful discussion. I would especially uh, like to express gratitude to all those who asked questions, especially those who are high school students. I deeply appreciate their bravery. So now we move on to the launch ceremony for the Hasekura statement immediately. Thank you so much for your cooperation. We will now prepare for the launch ceremony for the Hasekura statement, so please wait for a moment. Thank you.
We will now conduct the long ceremony for the Hasekura Statement. Now I'd like to ask President Ono to announce the launch of the Hasekura Statement. So let me read uh, the Hasekura Statement that we are about to uh, sign. A Hasekura Statement on the Promotion of the Social Sciences and Humanities in the Global Community. Announced by and signed by Tohoku University, uh, L'Orientale University of Naples, the University of British Columbia, Heidelberg University, Sapienza University of Rome, uh, Leiden University, Jagiellonian University, the University of Granada. Tohoku University, the institute that initially proposed the formation of the Hasekura League, celebrates the 100th anniversary of the founding of its social sciences and humanity faculties in 2022. To celebrate this occasion, leaders of the social sciences and humanities departments at eight universities involved in Hasekura League activities from seven different countries gathered at Tohoku University to exchange views on the promotion of the social sciences and humanities, SSH. Now, the discussion that followed focused on the significance of the SSH in the global community and the importance of the SSH in the fields of science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics, STEAM. Uh, this joint statement presents the members, tenants of the significance of the SSH and the role they should play in the global community through interdisciplinary research in cooperation with STEAM fields. We, the members of the Hasekura League share the following values concerning the future of the SSH and the League. One, academic exchange that values diversity. We will promote global knowledge exchange in the SSH fields by respecting conventional intellectual frameworks, but also by uh, relativizing them, by bearing in mind local and national values and perspectives, and by embracing diversity. We share the belief that uh, research results in SSH disciplines can contribute to innovation. At the same time, this is paired with the awareness that these include important fields of studies that do not readily lead to market value and research areas that can only achieve uh, results through long-term and focused work. Two, we are facing global challenges. We are committed to working to solve global problems while also addressing issues affecting individual communities and national societies. It is clear that these challenges cannot be solved by the individual disciplines of the SSH or by collaboration within the SSH alone. We will promote global research collaboration which includes interdisciplinary and integrated approaches in cooperation with STEAM fields. We will thereby demonstrate the inherent strengths of the SSH, which aim to examine uh, humanity in terms of historical, cultural, and societal uh, realities. Three, uh, towards a truly global league. The Hasekura League began with Tohoku University's invitation to European universities to participate in exchanges and it's, it is continuing to expand in the, into North America and Africa. In the future, we intend to make the league truly global by expanding into all regions, uh, including Asia. In addition to the exchange of researchers, we will place particular importance on students' exchange. We are on, of the firm belief that our actions will lead to the realization of individual happiness and peace for humankind and the building of a sustainable future through academic study and research. It was signed on September 30th, 2022. Thank you very much. Now leaders and deans of the member university on the stage, please sign the Hasekura statement.
Thank you very much. The Hasekura statement has now been approved. So everyone, please give a big round of applause. Thank you very much. Now we'd like to proceed to the photo session. So would you please move yourself to the front of the stage. We will have a photo session. Now leaders and deans of member universities will take a photo session. And then now they are preparing for the photo session. And Mr. Ono, Professor Ono and Professor Totoli is now holding the Hasegura statement and they are now adjusting the angle for the photo. And I'd like all of you on the stage to give a big smile to the camera at the center. So, are you ready? Okay, would you please look at the camera at the center? And we will have five photos. あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あ
humanities and social sciences. And uh, this uh, Hasekura Summit uh, would make uh, a wonderful uh, achievement. I really appreciate all the participants and also the uh, gathering today. Thank you very much indeed for your attention. Thank you so much indeed. Thank you very much. Now this concludes the Hasekura Summit, and leaders and deans of member universities will leave the state. So please give another big round of applause to see them off. Once again, thank you very much for joining us and have a good evening.